and actually just get started. Um, so as I mentioned, my name is John Swartz. I'm a postdoc working with Paolo Pasolacqua at UT Austin. Uh, I am both doing research with her as well as co-managing uh, or directing the Research Coordination Network, uh, Advancing the Analysis of High-Resolution Topography, which is an effort led by Paula, Chris Crosby, who you see here as John Swartz number three, uh, and Nancy Glenn, who might be joining us later in the clinic. Um, so with that said, um, we have a little too many people for, oh, we have another John Swartz entering the waiting room. I will admit a little bit. Yeah, I just too. admitted two more. <laughs> Sorry, this is just getting comical. Um, but we're going to just kind of dive into the clinic material. Um, so Paula will be helping me moderate this. And so if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and she will, uh, you know, interject and raise those questions. And if it's worth something, having a broader discussion for the entire audience, then we'll go ahead and have you unmute yourself and we can have a little bit of a discussion there. Uh, the format of the clinic is going to be, we're going to be bouncing back and forth between um, a presentation that I've created as well as the different notebooks and workflows on the Google Colab that we're going to be going through. Um, so with that, and John, I was going to say that, in, in, hi everyone, and you can certainly feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself, and show your video if you want to ask a question and voice it. We're not a lot of people, so I think differently from this morning from the keynotes, we can have a more fluid um kind of format so don't don't be afraid to to interrupt i mean i think for john it's going to be hard to see this thing so chris and i will monitor uh the chat and monitor if you're raising your hand but also just feel free to interrupt i mean what's important is that you get the most out of this so don't be afraid of you know interrupting speaking up and just it's going to make it way more fun Yes, thanks, Paula. Um, sorry, I was just taking a screenshot of the eight John Swartzes that we have. Uh, I did. This is going to this is going to on Instagram later. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so again, we 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 do have enough, you know, a, a good enough kind of number of people that we can have much more of a discussion than if we were doing a clinic with like eighty or hundred. So please feel free, yeah, to jump in there, like Paula mentioned. So with that said, we are let's see, we're recording. Let's go ahead and jump things off. So let's see. All right, can everyone see that? Can all the Johns uh, see that? Excellent. Okay, so thank you everyone for uh, signing up uh, for this clinic and joining us in this virtual CSDMS. I'm sad that we couldn't all meet in person, but hopefully next year we'll still see a lot of each other. Um, so as you know, this is the clinic for exploring surface processes and landscape connectivity through the use of high resolution topography and exploring the integration of data from high resolution topography in numerical modeling. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'll be your host, uh, along with Paolo Pasolacqua, but this is also a project that's co-led by Nancy Glenn and Chris Crosby. So this is all happening under the auspices of our research coordination network, which is funded by NSF EarthCube, that's labeled the Advancing the Analysis of High Resolution Topography, or A squared HRT. And this is an initiative funded by EarthCube that's focusing on assessing the current state of high resolution topography usage and developing best practices and linkages between models and observations within our community of practitioners. Uh, if you want to be involved with this effort, we have a, a working group on data model integration that some of you may know about that will be starting up with a series of uh, online webinars, as well as leading towards a white paper on the state of the science of data model integration. We also will be starting up a summer learning series focused on common workflows and data handling techniques involving high resolution topography that Chris and I are currently working on. And if you want to be involved with any of these initiatives or you have any other ideas or just want to know more about what we're doing, please contact us or uh, me specifically. So an overview of what we're going to be doing today, we're going to first go through an introduction to high resolution topography, its applications, as well as a broad sense of landscape and hydrologic connectivity. We're then going to move into a hands-on exercise looking at basic raster and terrain analysis and uses of high resolution topography using a series of Python workflows and notebooks. We're going to go back then to look at some details and uh, examples of the use of high resolution data within numerical modeling, followed by an exercise of actually running our own hydrodynamic models using an open source platform called Anuga. And then we're going to wrap up the day with uh, just a broad discussion about kind of what we've seen here or any sort of questions or comments uh, that people may have or ideas of how we can kind of move uh, the community and some of these themes forward. So broadly, we want to start off with a question of what is high resolution topography. This doesn't really have a good definition. A lot of people will say they know it when they see it. But generally, you can define it as technology that can acquire meter to submeter scale data sets. So this encompasses a wide variety of platforms at this point. So you have LIDAR, 
you have photogrammetry, such as drone structure from motion, you have synthetic aperture radar, or you have multi-beam bathymetry if you're working in a subaqueous environment. What you get with using these sorts of techniques and platforms is accurate characterization of small-scale processes and landscape structure or vegetation structure. But with this accuracy and with this detail comes challenges in data handling and computation because the data sets of over large spatial areas can become quite uh, complex and quite large in terms of size. So we're gonna start by just moving through the two most basic terrestrial high-resolution top topography methods, which is LIDAR and structure of motion. So starting with LIDAR, the, the, just to put it in a very simple way, what we're doing with LIDAR is we're measuring the distance that a laser travels in two-way travel time. And this is a laser that can be sourced from a spaceborne, airborne, or terrestrial platform. LIDAR gives us a vertical accuracy typically in the five to 15 centimeter range and horizontal accuracy in a 20 centimeter to one meter range depending on the point density of our acquisition. Now, the quality of LIDAR can be highly variable as anyone who's used it a lot can know. So you, have, so you can occasionally have location uncertainty, you can have errors associated with steep terrain slopes, you can have errors associated with uh, dense vegetation, you can have errors associated with your flight footprint. A lot of different things go into LIDAR acquisition and processing, and so understanding these workflows is critical to assessing your data quality. One of the advantages that LIDAR has over other technologies, which is why it's so widely used, is that we're not simply getting a single elevation value for a single beam or return. Instead, we're getting a profile that looks like the above right diagram, where a laser sent from a LIDAR platform is passing through the canopy before finally hitting the ground. And so if we look at the time series of those returned energies, we can assign different variables to these different returns and let us differentiate and subtract out vegetation structure as well as the final ground return, which gives us those nice, beautiful digital terrain models or bare earth DEMs that uh, we love to use. So LIDAR does not give you a DEM from, uh, from the platform. It doesn't give you a DEM out of the box. You have to process it. And what it does give you are point clouds. Now, point clouds are an interesting subject in their own right, but it's kind of just useful to, to look at what a point cloud is and kind of understand what its structure is and how we might use it. And so if we were running this in person, like if uh, we were un unfortunately subject to the, uh, the pandemic of COVID right now, we'd be sitting in this building right here, which is CSDMS on CU Boulder's East Campus. This is a point cloud that's uh, being visualized in Open Topography's online point cloud browser system, which is a really cool platform I suggest you use. And you can see that with, by visualizing the terrain in this way, we can see both the kind of ground, we can see the trees, we can see building structure, we can see the front range up in the distance. But we have all these details of the landscape, not just the kind of bare earth terrain. And so by handling point clouds derived from LiDAR data or other platforms, we have the ability to kind of query different aspects of the Earth's surface in a really uh, interesting and useful way. So if we have a point cloud from a given LiDAR uh, survey, how do we get to those DEMs or those rasters that are often what our end product is that we then want to use in our analysis and use in our science? So the very kind of basic workflow is we would acquire and QC a survey. So this is an example from the USDA Forest Service looking at different flight paths and the different density of, pul of both pulses, outgoing pulses from the LiDAR instrument, as well as returns, seeing that the actual return density can be quite variable. We'll take those returns, which form our point cloud, and we'll classify those. So we'll classify which points correspond to the ground surface, which points correspond to the vegetation surface, which points correspond to water or buildings or what have you, however many kind of classes you're, you're uh, viewing. You'll take those returns or those points and then you'll grid them based on some return density. So again, as we saw in this uh, upper left image here, the return density for a given survey can be quite variable. And so we need to make some sort of grid resolution uh, choice that honors our data and doesn't either kind of capture things in a too sparse or too dense manner so we can optimize what resolution we're getting for our eventual DEM. What I'm showing here are just a series of algorithms from the points to grid algorithm that Open Topography uses in its data server for serving up DEMs from the LiDAR point clouds that they have archived. And then finally, after following this workflow, we'd get our beautiful raster, in this case, a bare earth raster of a meandering river system somewhere in the American West. So LiDAR is not just about kind of terrestrial systems, however, and I'm just gonna put this out here because I think it's a really interesting and important point, especially as the technology becomes more mature and its uses become more um, ubiquitous. But we have the ability through certain uh, LiDAR platforms to acquire topobathymetric LiDAR, which allows us to 
see, basically see through the water column if water conditions are correct. And so what we can do here then is capture the, the elevation structure or the landscape structure of the subaerial and subaqueous environments at the same time without using different surveys or different types of um, acquisition technology. And so this is an example from the Gulf of Mexico looking at the San Luis Pass Tidal Inlet showing the structure of the barrier islands and then just beautiful detail and imaging. Oh, we have another John Swartz. Um, just beautiful detail and imaging of this uh, flood tide delta located down in the Gulf. And so this uh, data is starting to become more publicly available. It's starting to be acquired more uh, widely. And so the potential advantages of the coastal and fluvial systems is pretty exciting to think about. So I just wanted to kind of put a plug in there for that. Okay, so the next type of technology that we most commonly use and is becoming really, really uh, widely applied is structure for motion photogrammetry. So this is that technology that we know from things like either terrestrial gigapan systems or more commonly now drone systems. But it basically relies on building a 3D model by matching corresponding scale invariant features using multiple angles or offsets of uh, just imagery or just photography. And so in the example here, we can see a series of four uh, photos from a desert environment looking at the same scale invariant feature that's highlighted in the red box. And we can build them 3D models or point clouds of these surfaces without any a priori knowledge of where we are, what our camera angles are, what our locations are, because we have these scale invariant features that we then match and then use uh, basically off the shelf commercial software to build very dense point clouds and digital surface models. This can be done really cheaply, it can be done uh, quickly, and so as a result, it's really exploded in usage and is starting to kind of overtake LiDAR in terms of just how uh, the average user can kind of go out and acquire their own surveys. So as I mentioned, we can acquire really nice 3D models pretty quickly, and we can also do some really amazing science with them. Um, and so as an example, this is some work by Kendra Johnson looking at uh, fault zone topography. So going out there and mapping this fault surface using a structure for motion uh, technique. And so what you can see in her work is that you can uh, build, and, uh, you can both acquire and build ultra high quality structure for motion DEMs with extreme photo density. But then if we compare it to pre-existing LIDAR surveys, uh, once we have our ground control points in there, are giving us almost LIDAR quality of those bare earth terrain models from a pretty inexpensive drone survey. So this is your own user acquired drone versus a like, kind of spec aerial LIDAR survey. We're getting pretty good results. So that's great, but what's the catch with that? If it's so wonderful, why aren't we using this for everything instead of LIDAR? One is it can be really difficult to acquire really large spatial areas using some of these techniques, particularly the drone-based ones, versus aerial uh, LIDAR surveys. Additionally, and this is a huge one, they cannot see through vegetation, right? What makes LIDAR so powerful is that we get multiple returns for every single pulse that let us differentiate between what's vegetation, what's the ground, what's man-made structures, and so on. Whereas with structure for motion, all we're building is a 3D surface, a very detailed 3D surface, but one that encapsulates and incorporates all those different elements that we're seeing in a photograph. We can also have some issues with lens and camera distortions, such as I'm illustrating here on the right, that when propagated over really large areas in your DEM can lead to some sorts of doming or banding of the features. Although there are ways of processing this out. But one of the major things compared to LIDAR that can make using structure for motion challenging is that right now there's a lack of standardization in acquisition and processing and data quality. We don't have good standards for how we handle metadata associated with structure for motion. We don't have good standards for what data you report or how you handle and store the data like we do with LIDAR. And so as a result, when we want to compare, like for instance, repeat surveys like pre and post storm or pre and post uh, fault rupture, not having these details of the processing can make uh, making those sorts of comparisons difficult in a really concrete way. So I've mentioned a few times that both LIDAR and structure for motion, digital terrain or bare earth models versus digital surface models. And it's worth just kind of spelling out in a little more detail what that actually means. So DTMs and DSMs are probably the most commonly encountered top, top, uh, topography data that we'll see. So a DTM is that classic bare earth surface. So this is using LIDAR, stripping away the vegetation and building a really, really nice terrain model of what the landscape looked like if you didn't have any of those pesky trees or bushes in the way. With a DSM, that's what we're looking at in the upper, uh, upper right here. This is just the highest point structure. So this is just the highest elevation that could correspond to the terrain, it could correspond to a building, could correspond to the tree canopy, and so on. 
What with LiDAR, we can build both of those, but with structure for motion, we're typically limited to digital surface models, although there are some interesting processing workflows you can do to try to build a terrain model. Uh, and both have utility depending on the science. So we don't always want to jump, just jump to these digital terrain models, because often that can be neglecting really interesting structure of the landscape involving the vegetation that might be really important for the question we're trying to ask. So just to illustrate the difference uh, between a kind of surface model and a terrain model using a, a, an example from north of Houston. So this is a really densely vegetated um, lowland depositional plain setting. On the left here, you can see a high resolution, uh, just visible imagery, uh, satellite image from GOI. And the right is a one meter LIDAR image stripping all that away. So we can see that with using things like DTMs and LIDAR derived elevation models, we can see kind of an unprecedented level of detail of the landscape. So on the left, you might be able to point out where some of the stream locations are. You might be able to point out where some of these smaller creeks and drainages are. But the main signal that you see is just that you have kind of different patterns of vegetation. When we remove all that, we can see just beautiful detail of all these meandering uh, small scale stream systems that are responsible for kind of really kind of plumbing the landscape in a lot of these lowland terrains. So what are some common applications and uses of high resolution topography? We've touched on a few of them so far, but I just want to go kind of go through some of the ones that are most commonly used and kind of the most exciting in my opinion. So one is we can use them to, you can use high resolution topography to really characterize the structure of the landscape. So like in the previous image, we can strip out all that vegetation and we can understand, you know, what the structure of these drainage networks really are. We can also use it to characterize small scale processes and surface characteristics that might be difficult to capture in a synoptic way otherwise. So this is like the observation of, of hill slope failure or creep, the observation of very small scale drainage systems in floodplains, things like that. We can use high resolution topography as an input to surface process modeling. So we can use it to derive attributes that are necessary for fully parameterizing our model, or we can use it as kind of raw inputs into the model itself. We can also use it to get detailed information about the vegetation canopy structure. So linking different types of vegetation or different kind of vegetation characteristics to different portions of the landscape, which is like actually touches upon some of the keynotes that we saw earlier today. And then finally, what's becoming more and more common is to use these techniques to do really high precision change detection. So on the right is a, a bit of work by Jonathan Mason on the Trinity River also in Texas looking at the change of the plan form geometry and volumes of point bars of the river between a large flood that occurred between 2011 and 2015 and doing quantitative change detection of how much volume was lost and built on each point bar going downstream in the river. So when we talk about the landscape structure, we've been looking and trying to characterize this since the start of geomorphology and geology, right? And one of the biggest revolutions that occurred was the use of, or the, the ability to kind of use widely available uh, topography data worldwide, such as the SRTM uh, data sets, which are in 30 meter spatial resolution. Now, if we kind of zoom into an area here, and this is all in West Texas, by the way, we can see that in the upper right, we have that 30 meter DEM from the SRTM data, and we have a one meter DEM from the USGS, uh, that's a LIDAR derived DEM. And when you're just looking in terms of these, they look fairly similar. Maybe the SRTM is a little bit hazier, maybe the LIDAR is a little sharper, but in general, you can kind of see similarities in terms of the landscape structure. What high resolution topography really allows you to do is look at the small scale structure and detail of what's kind of dominating this landscape. So I've zoomed in now on that area and I've applied a hill shade to that DEM and we can see now all these kind of different features that are really, really interesting to think about and think about their role and what's controlling the processes of this landscape. So as I mentioned, high, the, one of the kind of uses or utilities of high resolution topography is not just in having a really, you know, high quality, big data set that you can do all these sort of uh, computations or metrics on, but it's also just letting you see and understand the landscape better than you could previously. So if we start annotating this landscape here, we can see all these sorts of interesting observations or features that might lead to the formulations of questions that we'd want to then go out and test either in a field campaign or through an numerical model. So for instance, here, we can see the asymmetrical divides of these drainage basins where we have kind of really steep channel heads eating away into this plateau. This plateau is dominated by all these funky depressions that I don't have no idea what they are. Within the drainage network here that's eating away into this plateau, we can see that it's interrupted all over the place by dozens and dozens of small scale dam structures, which are agricultural stock tanks 
or dams that are in place at a local level and have almost no regulation or documentation at all. So when we look at the landscape like this, we don't just say, oh, we know now where the drainage networks are, we know what the drainage divides are, but we can start asking questions about what is the implication of the fact that every single channel head in this landscape has been interrupted by a dam? What is the implication for these asymmetrical divides? High resolution topography gives us the ability to both kind of better quantitatively query the landscape and do computations and analysis on, but also formulate ideas or hypotheses that we go then go out and test about what processes are actually active. Now with networks, one of the biggest advances in things like network delineation and flood modeling has come from high resolution topography, because especially in lowland systems, we need this high resolution topography to really resolve these networks and resolve the landscape. So here I put just together four panels of 30 meter SRTM data, the 10 meter national elevation data set, which until recently was the gold standard continental US uh, data set that you had publicly available, three meter LIDAR also from the national elevation data set, and then one meter LIDAR. So you can see that in each step of this resolution, we're getting more and more detail into the structure of the landscape. And that has pretty significant implications to our understanding of both the kind of network structure as well as just the amount of relief that exists here. So you can see, for instance, here, each of those uh, um, data sets plotted all along this yellow profile. And you can see that all the other data sets aside from the one meter are drastically under measuring and under representing the amount of relief that actually exists within this floodplain. And that amount of relief has a lot of implications both for flood routing and propagation, but also things like how fast is this landscape dissecting? What are the you know, potentials for avulsion and so forth? So with data sets like this, we've actually been able to really improve our characterization of flood mapping. So in this example here, we have the FEMA, the FEMA 100 year flood zone, and then we have an approved flood zone based on the recognition using high resolution topography of these small scale gullies and structures that are actually uh, much more common in the landscape than we would have previously thought. And just to illustrate that further, here's the 10 meter national elevation data set of a floodplain in Texas, and here's the three meter LIDAR uh, of the same area, again, showing that without this high resolution topography, we're missing a lot of the fundamental structure of the landscape that has a lot of implications both for surface processes, but also things like ecosystem service and habitat distribution. So not to neglect what we can get with, uh, from the vegetation, as I mentioned before, the high resolution topography, specifically the LIDAR, allows for that characterization of the vegetation structure, but also the type and the density. And so we can start using these techniques to relate our landscape structure, like the you know, drainage density of a floodplain or so on, to what kind of the ecological systems and biospheres are across the, the different portions of the landscape. Also, interestingly, and we'll see some more of this later on, we can use this data to more accurately characterize and parameterize things like land cover and surface attributes, which might be potential inputs into numerical modeling. And finally, as we already saw with the Trinity River, we're seeing a lot of use of these now for rapid superficial change detection. So here's an example of looking at kind of really detailed structure of a landslide displacement using drone structure for motion imagery. And so you can see here then, looking at a pre, pre and post the, the, uh, the landslide event, a lot of small scale deformation and features that help us understand how landslides occur and also understand kind of actual magnitude of displacement in a horizontal way that would just never be possible without this sort of very high resolution techniques. Okay, so now that we've basked in the glory of high resolution topography and we've seen a lot of what it can do and what some of the common applications are, let's give it a try ourselves. Let's start playing with some data. So I'm gonna exit the presentation and in the email I sent to everyone earlier, you should have seen a link to the GitHub that I put together for this, uh, for this clinic. And if you are following along with me here, so I'm looking at the main screen of GitHub right now, you'll see a bunch of data folders, which we'll deal with later, and then we'll see a series of notebooks here. Now for John, we we'll still see the, the slide, actually. In the, still see the slide? Okay. It might be still either loading yep, yep. or... Let me, let, me, let me pull it up. Can everyone see that now? It's coming, yeah, we got it. All good, okay. All right, so now, now that we can all see the GitHub here, and I've, this, you should have seen this link in the email, we're gonna click on this first notebook, which is labeled CSDMS 2020 HRT part one. 
So we'll open that. It's a little big, so it might take a while to load. Oh, there we go. And so you should be confronted with this screen. So we're just looking at the Python notebook within GitHub. And what we want to do, which is going to allow us to actually have some fun with this, is click the small button above the title labeled Open in Colab. And I know that we might have some issues with this for people who are outside of the United States. Uh, if, if you do, I sincerely apologize, but these notebooks are going to be available to everyone for you to try to incorporate and build in your local environment. Just within the confines of the clinic, uh, we weren't able to figure out a way of doing this on everyone's kind of home, home installation. If people um, want to use them, so you can either put messages in the chat if it's not loading for whatever reason or you there's also an option for using the reactions at the bottom, so you can always give a thumbs up. And so, um, okay, there's a question from Nicole, John. Yes. Nice. So Nicole, uh, here, let me go back to the GitHub and show you. So if you're on the main uh, GitHub folder, you'll see part one notebook. So you click on, you click on that notebook that's labeled part one. It'll load. And then do you see the small button that's labeled Open in Colab? You'll click on that. Great. OK. So now hopefully everyone is able to open the notebook and then click on Open in Colab and Open in Colab. And so this is a really, really cool platform that allows us to basically run and handle everything in a Google virtual environment. So we don't have to deal with Python installations and uh, versioning and getting all the libraries and dependencies installed in everyone's personal machine. So it's a really cool tool for clinics and teaching. Um, so once you have the notebook open within Colab, again, hopefully, hopefully everyone was able to do this. I again apologize if, if for some reason we have some you know, regional issues. But once we have the notebook open in Colab, we'll go ahead and connect to a hosted runtime. So in the upper right corner, you'll see a little button that says connect and then just click connect and then click to hosted runtime. And what this is doing is asking Google Colab to provide us with a virtual, with, with essentially a virtual machine that we'll use to do all our computations. So once you've done that, you'll see that it's working because you'll have a little status indicator in the upper right that shows your RAM and disk space. Uh, and they actually give you a pretty good number of resources, which will come in handy in the second part of this clinic for sure. So once you open the notebook, you click on Open in Google Colab, and you've connected to a runtime, we can go ahead and actually get started running through this workflow and kind of just having some fun with some of the data. So the first part of this is going to be basic handling and analysis of high-resolution topography data and then we're going to showcase some kind of more advanced techniques or the potential for using Python workflows to do terrain analysis and network analysis using high resolution DEMs. Um, most of what we're going to be doing today is going to rely on an open source toolbox called Whitebox Tools that was developed by uh, John Lindsay of University of Guelph. Uh, this is an incredibly, incredibly powerful open source tool set. Uh, that's really, really fun to play with. And so if you're someone who's uh, kind of terrain inclined or interested in using Python tools and landscape analysis, please uh, check out uh, their GitHub and give some of these tools a shot. And, but we're going to showcase some of them today. Okay. So now if we're all open in Google Colab, we have our environment set up, we can go ahead and we can start actually then running some of these cells. And so I've structured this and tried to document it in a way that should be fairly easy to follow, but please just say something in the chat or uh, raise your hand if you have any questions or, or you're not quite getting what, what step we're at here. So we're going to start by cloning the GitHub, which has a lot of the files that we need in it, and installing our environments and importing all our necessary libraries. So if you're not familiar with Python or uh, Google Colab, you can execute a cell, which I've already pre-populated and wrote, wrote out all the routines that we're going to do, either by hitting Shift-Enter or pressing the little play button that's to the left-hand side of every single cell. So when you press the little play button, you'll get a warning saying the, note, the notebook was not authored by Google, which is true because it's authored by me. We'll click Run anyway. And what we're doing then now 
Is John, did you want us to clear all the outputs first or no? Oh, yes. Thank you, Paula. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, sorry, I, yeah, I jumped the gun here a little bit. Um, if you could, please, um, and you can do it even after you hit the run on that cell, could you click edit underneath the notebook title right here and hit just clear all output? Um, we, we have to do this because for some reason the, the notebook kind of has all the previous output populated in it, which was not what we want. Um, so it just ruins the surprise. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, thank you, Pella. Yeah, so please go ahead and just clear the output. Again, like you saw, it didn't, it didn't affect anything that we're doing if you had already clicked run on the cell. But I can just say what we're doing a little bit here. So what we did was we cloned that GitHub directory, which had a lot of our necessary files. And then we ins installed in our virtual environment all the different toolboxes and libraries that we're going to use in our terrain analysis. And you'll know that it's done because we'll have uh, we'll show a little ready uh, sign at the bottom. So once you see that, you've downloaded and you've installed all the necessary libraries for the exercise we're going to do. So once we have the libraries installed, we also have to import them. So we've installed in our virtual environment all these different things like NumPy, Matplotlib, Seaborn, Rasteria, which are all just basically ways of either handling data sets or plotting data sets or visualizing data sets. But now we just need to import them as tools or commands that we can then use to actually query our data. So we'll go ahead and just run that cell again. And you'll see once that stops spinning that it's done. So now we've installed all our libraries and we've imported all our libraries. And now we have to actually pull in all the data that we're going to use in this exercise. So one of the disadvantages of GitHub is that you can't have large file sizes. And if anyone's ever worked with LiDAR data before, you know that even small uh, spatial areas can be pretty large. And so what I've done here in the cell is just created a little uh, downloader that will pull from my personal Google Drive all the geotiffs of different topographic data sets that we're going to use in our analysis today. So go ahead and click play there. And you'll start seeing then in the bottom here, the output, the script that says that you're downloading that data and then a done when it's uh, done downloading. And while it's, we're doing that, we can actually see where these things are going. If you open the file, little file tab to the left, you can see we have our CSDMS Clinic 2020 folder. We can see data. We can see the San Luis because we're gonna be working in the San Luis mountains. And then we can see all the data sets that we've either imported from GitHub or a downloading from Google Drive actually populated right here. And so this is pretty fun because it also allows you then to actually take any of the output that we're running in Colab, even though it's fully virtual, and transfer it to your own Google Drive or just download it to your home PC if you want to save any of these outputs or continue playing with them. Okay, so we've downloaded all of the necessary DEMs. Now we just need to set our data directory for our future analysis. And you, so you can see then we've just printed the, what's in that directory, which are the same files that we were just looking at the left-hand side here, which are, again, are the DMs that we're going to use in our analysis. So we've installed our libraries. We've imported them. We've imported all the necessary data sets for our workflows today. And let's just have a look at where we're going to be working. As I mentioned, it's going to be in the San Luis Mountains, which, if you're not familiar, are down here. So if we exercise this cell, I've just put it in a little a little um, folio module that just lets us have a kind of interactive environment for looking at um, you can see that we're going to be exploring um, an area just north of Taos here. And so if we zoom in here, you can see the Rio Grande River to the left, and you can see that we're going to be investigating this area of mountainous watersheds transferring into the alluvial valley uh, over to the left. So just kind of a fun little display. You, this is just kind of barely scratching the surface of the power of things like Folium and some of the other visualization, visualization techniques, but I wanted just to kind of showcase their utility. Okay. Paolo, can you still hear me okay? I'm getting a low system resource message that my audio quality might suffer. Good? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I was hearing a little bit of noise, but it's still coming across clear, okay, so no issues. Excellent. John, you might want to see if you can make your, your screen a little bigger. I don't know if that would be helpful. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. It's true. Depending on the... Make your fonts a little bit bigger. I think we did. Yeah, just zoom in, John, like we did oh, that, yeah, yeah. that time. Sure. Yeah. I forgot about that. Depending on your monitor size, that's true. That's... 
Is that better for everyone? Yeah, that looks better for me, at least on my screen. Anybody else with issues with the font or this looks good? You can give us thumbs up or whatever. Yeah, with, with things like that, everyone, please let me know um, so I can correct if, if something could be better or you know um, we have any issues we need to work out. So can everyone read the font size okay? Everyone can kind of see the outputs okay? I think, I think in this situation, silence is good. Okay. So we've had some fun looking at where we are. We're, we're in, the, in the San Luis Mountains here, just uh, east of the Rio Grande in New Mexico. So let's then start actually loading and plotting our different raster data sets. So here we're gonna import white box tools for the first time, and we're gonna set its working directory, and then we're actually gonna start opening up our different data rasters. So let's run that cell to download white box. We're installing it, and then we're just, again, setting its data directory to that same directory that we had put all our DEMs in. So we're going to now look at what those EMs actually look like. So we saw from the, from the folium uh, plot that we're going to be looking at a, a mountainous area, but one that's kind of trans, uh, transitioning to a relatively uh, flatter terrain as we move towards the Rio Grande. So let's see how those look using both a one meter DEM as well as a 30 meter SRTM DEM. So let's first load or open one of our DEMs. So this is just a routine that's using uh, Rastereo to open a GeoTIFF DEM, so a DEM that exists in a TIFF format, which is a very common format, and we're reading it into a NumPy array. And if you're not familiar with Python or NumPy, uh, basically this is just letting us treat our raster as a numeric array, which allows us to kind of perform computations on it in a really efficient way. So we can see that we've opened our uh, high resolution topography DEM, which was originally as a TIFF, and now it's an array. And we can see the size of the array there, so this is essentially the pixel extent. We'll do the same thing with our 30 meter SRTM digital service model. So you can see that even though the extents of the SRTM data and the LIDAR uh, data are exactly the same spatially, the number of cells associated with each array are drastically different because the resolutions are very different, right? We have a one meter by one meter DEM from the LIDAR, and we have a 30 meter by 30 meter DEM for the SRTM. So let's now plot both our LIDAR and our SRTM data sets and see how they look for this region. So plotting here, plotting can sometimes take a little bit of time depending on the size of the data set, but you should be left then with on the left, a DEM from our one meter LIDAR and a DEM from our 30 meter SRTM. So DEMs without a hill shade can be a little hard to kind of see detailed structure on as uh, some of you may know, but it's interesting that between these two, they look very similar. Again, the 30 meter might be a little fuzzier, a little hazier compared to the one meter, but overall, the kind of gross structure of the landscape looks pretty similar between these two data sets. So let's see then what the actual distribution of elevations of these data sets look like. Is there a difference between the LIDAR and the SRTM data? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take those arrays that we read in from our TIFFs, and we're just going to plot histograms of them. So we're going to just look at the distribution of elevation data across this spatial extent. So on the top here, you can see the DEM uh, distribution from the LIDAR. And in the bottom, you can see the SRTM. So you can see that despite the difference in resolution, despite the kind of uh, platform of acquisition, and despite the kind of data quality, the overall structure of the landscape between these two is almost identical. We're kind of capturing the broad distribution uh, in a very, very similar way, despite the differences in uh, where these data are from. So that's kind of interesting. Keep that in mind for uh, when we move into the next section here. So next, we're going to actually start taking those DEMs or those rasters and performing calculations on them. And the first thing that we want to do is just create a hill shade uh, to help our visualization. As I mentioned, and as you saw above, DEMs without a hill shade kind of don't look like very much. And so we just want to better visualize that. Now, if you're not familiar with what a hill shade is, we're essentially going to basically specify an azimuth and angle of illumination that basically will create artificial shading and shadows that let us better visualize what's high, what's low, what's steep relief, and so on. So let's then calculate using white box some uh, hill shades for each of these DEMs. So this cell here that we've executed has created a hill shade for our LiDAR data and a hill shade for our SRTM data, and then read both of those back into arrays, again, to allow for easier plotting. So now that we've calculated our hill shade rasters, let's visualize them the same way that we did our DEMs. OK, 
Okay, now we can see some pretty significant differences, right? The DEMs by themselves didn't really look that distinctive, but now that we've applied a hill shade, we can see that the LIDAR is capturing a lot more of that small scale detail and variation within the landscape as compared to the SRATM data. But that also then makes it interesting that the distributions of elevations were so similar. So let's zoom in then on a smaller portion of this landscape and do some more, some more calculations and attribute analysis. Um, again, it, though, I just want to emphasize that the overall structure between these is really similar, uh, which is though surprising that the cell size from the LIDAR is 1 uh, 900th what the SRTM data is. But if we zoom in there, we can see what some of the implications of that kind of smaller scale uh, cell size is, where if we look at the headwaters of our small catchment, the SRTM data and the LIDAR data are both kind of capturing the broad structure in terms of where our ridge positions are, where we have highs and where we have lows, but we're missing a lot of really, really important detail about the channel network in these headwaters. We're missing important details about the transition between channel processes and hill slope processes. We're missing detail about potential mass movements and failures. And that's really what the power of high topography is, is letting you understand and kind of characterize and quantify those sorts of smaller scale processes, even if the bulk structure of the landscape is, is fairly consistent. So let's then subset that larger DEM into a smaller area that we'll be able to use and run uh, some more kind of computationally expensive algorithms on. We have to do this just to uh, conserve RAM because we don't actually get much, that much of it from Google Colab. So this was our kind of original study extent. Um, and we're going to kind of zoom in on the area of this red box here and use that for all our future calculations and work in this exercise. So let's create some hill shades um, for the LIDAR and the SRTM data from this smaller region. So we're um, creating the hill shades again with white box tools. And so now you can see in that smaller region just what the structure of the smaller catchment looks like. So again, we can see the kind of alluvial plain that's being dissected by all these gullies uh, in streams uh, coming out of the mountains. And again, over to the west would be the Rio Grande River, which all these are flowing into. Okay, so let's then start playing with some of the more advanced things that we can do with raster data and high resolution topography using tools like white box tools. So one of the kind of fun things to do with top topography data, especially in kind of uh, really dissected or uh, heavily channelized environments, is detrending DEMs to look at the kind of relative topography or relative relief. And so uh, if any of you have ever seen some of the really kind of cool images or visualizations of river valleys or meandering river systems that have been detrended so that the point bars and the channels really kind of pop, this is what this technique is. And I want to sh showcase and show you how actually easy it is to do on your own. And it's just kind of fun to play with. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to detrend a DEM and calculate some DEM derivatives. So again, detrending is essentially fitting a trend surface through some sparse sampling of a digital elevation model, creating a new surface from that, and then subtracting the two surfaces. So in this example here, if we have a kind of sloped environment like this, we would sample what that plane is, and then by subtracting out that plane from the original data, we would flatten it out by whatever that trend was, which would allow us to better kind of visualize what was positive, and what was negative versus that original plane. So let's try that on our data set by creating a second order polynomial surface with zero being a flat plane for our one meter LIDAR DEM. So we're gonna use again white box tools to build that second order polynomial. And then we're gonna read that back into an array and then use those arrays to kind of subtract everything out again using white box tools. Um, I also just wanna kind of emphasize here the power of doing a lot of this analysis and a lot of these workflows in something like Python is that it has a, doesn't have as much overhead as using things within like QGIS or ArcGIS would. So for instance, here, we just created a polynomial trend surface sampling from a DEM and then writing that all out in about 19 seconds, whereas the same operation in ArcGIS could take two to five minutes. Let's then subtract that trend surface that we just created from our original DEM. Done very quickly again. And then let's now plot our original DEM the hill shade, the trend surface that we created, and what the resulting detrended DEM actually looks like. The plotting actually takes longer than the computation itself, which is, which is kind of funny. OK, cool. So again, we have our original DEM here. We have the hill shade. We have the trend surface, or that second order polynomial that we created. And then we have the detrended DEM, which again is 
the subtraction of this trend service from the DEM. So you can see then in terms of this kind of residual topography, removing out the overall kind of slope of the landscape, we have pretty significant differences from the western side of our study area to the eastern side, which we might have guessed from the hillshade, right? So in the west, overall things are a lot lower elevation. We have more large flat areas. We have more kind of just deep dissection of a relatively planar surface. Whereas to the east, we have much more rugged terrain, much higher highs and much lower lows. And again, this corresponds with coming out of the fringes of the San Luis Mountains into the Rio Grande Valley itself. So let's then play with some of the other things that we can kind of do very quickly. So here we're going to calculate again using white box tools. We're going to calculate slope, curvature, and aspect from our one meter DEM. Now, one of the things that we often want to do with rasters and with high resolution topography is we'll actually look at not just the kind of elevation structure, but kind of landscape characteristics or attributes, such as which direction are different portions of the landscape facing, how steep are they, what's the curvature of them. Because this information helps us understand things like surface roughness. It helps us understand potential channelization, potential hill slope processes, things like that. So let's then plot those different aspects or those different um, characteristics of the landscape that we just, we just calculated and kind of see what the, they actually look like for a very high resolution uh, DEM of a mountainous area. Oh, cool. So now we're actually seeing some color, right? So we have our hillshade again in the upper left, just showing us the kind of structure of the landscape. You can see the aspect here showing us kind of the different facing slopes uh, in very, very graphic detail. We have our slope, and then we have what's a derivative of the slope, but curvature. Now we'll get to curvature later in the channel analysis portion, but what's really important to point out with all of these is that while we can are, just, are able to see kind of very high definition structure of the landscape through things like hill shapes, it's these attributes which are going to help us actually move the needle in terms of automating some of our terrain classifications or really understanding kind of the evolution of connectivity in these landscapes. And to kind of make that point, let's load in our original SRTM data set and see how attributes of that compare. Now, if you remember from our just from looking at the DEM, the overall structure of the landscape in terms of elevation between the SRTM data and the LIDAR data set are almost identical, right? But now when we start looking at some of these kind of different uh, you know, metrics or characters or, or parameters of the landscape, such as aspect or slope or curvature, these are all plotted on the same exact scale, you see really, really big differences start to emerge because now we're running into the issues of both how the data is acquired, but also things like the actual just cell size and resolution of features that we're able to see. So let's compare the slope and aspect from the LIDAR and the SRTM data side by side to really kind of drive that point home. While this is running, John, I was going to check, is everybody following along? You're all uh, seeing these images. If you don't, just let us know. Or yeah, if you want John to move slower or move faster, we, we'll do this for a bunch more time. So it would be good to get a sense if this is a good speed or no. Yeah, please feel free to ask any questions or if you have any comments. Um, we, again, we're a small enough group um, that we can, we, can, we can have a little more informality. All good. Excellent. Um, awesome. Thanks the, for the what feedback. Is, what's the scale on the plots, the, the length scales? Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, there, the domain that we're looking at here is roughly uh, 3,500 meters by 6,500 meters. Um, sorry, I should have plotted a, a length bar here. Okay. Are those just pixel numbers on the, on the on Yes, the exactly. So, so because, we're plotting, because we're plotting NumPy arrays, they're just pixel numbers. So they're, they're kind of dimensionless like that, which is why for the same spatial area and the same size, uh, we have very different scales, and that's again because in the SRTM each pixel is 30 meters by 30 meters, whereas the LIDAR is one by one. So the LIDAR, since it's one by one... LIDAR is, is straight meters. Exactly, exactly. Right. And so you can see then comparing these that, again, the overall structure was very similar between them, but the detail or, of, the, of the landscape in terms of a lot of these parameters like slope, it's starting to get really, really big deviations in terms of like the distribution of slopes across the landscape or even what kind of what how we can kind of characterize aspect this starts to matter when we're trying to do kind of larger scale analyses of landscapes where we might only have things like srtm or more global data sets because we might then kind of fool ourselves and think that we can more accurately characterize a lot of these parameters than we might actually be able to and i'll show an example of that right now 
So what we're going to do is we're actually then going to quantify how our landscape looks in terms of something like slope and compare LIDAR to SRTM. So again, we're going to plot our, our slope raster into a NumPy array, and we're going to do the same thing for SRTM. And the reason why I'm doing this, by the way, before we plot histograms is because all rasters in GeoTIFF format, or most of them, have no data values. And a no data value needs to be converted into a not a number value in a NumPy array to allow you actually to make a histogram out of it. So that's the only reason we're doing this intermediate step here. So now that we've kind of created our NumPy arrays from LIDAR and SRTM, let's plot the slope distributions for both of these. And remember, the elevation histograms were identical. But the slope distributions for these are extremely different. We all have that peak around five, five degrees slope. But the SRTM, or the lower resolution data, is completely missing the second modality about 30 to 35 meters, or 30, 30 to 35 degrees. It's just absent within the SRTM data. This matters a lot for, again, the characterization of a lot of things like the, the divide between hill slope and channel processes, or where we ha might potentially have channelization in the landscape, or surface roughness. The ability to kind of better characterize the actual kind of distribution of the landscape and characterize a lot of these kind of relatively small scale features that are spatially small scale but are really important for potentially driving uh, surface processes dynamics. And so I just want to kind of emphasize that point through here. All right. So now that we've kind of played with rasters a little bit and played with um, how we can kind of visualize some data, how we can actually start quantifying different measures of the landscape. We're going to jump back into the presentation, but before I do that, does anyone have any questions about kind of what we've gone through so far or what we're seeing here or what kind of the difference between the high resolution data and, and the lower resolution data? Cool. All right then. Let's hop back in for just a little bit of background on kind of network processes, and then we're going to actually play with that within the, uh, the collab. Don, I was going to, yeah, go ahead, Nicole. Um, so this is super cool. Um, and this would be super great for teaching. And I'm wondering if I'm guessing this is going to go away after this clinic because you don't necessarily. No, 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 no. Go on. This is going to be free and publicly available uh, forever. Oh, okay. So even though the data are sitting in your own Google Drive, you're going to leave them there for yes. us? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very generous of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, you should, uh, sorry, I'm just going to put on my CSDMS hat for a second. You should think about um, including these in the CSDMS, uh, the educational part where they have the different labs. I think this would be super helpful if it's not there already. That's a great idea, that's Nicole. A great idea. Thank you. And Nicole will also post these on open topography, so they're accessible there as well. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Any other, any other questions or comments? That's a great idea about the repository. We'll make sure to do that. Yeah, it is. John, I was going to say, I think your audio is perfectly fine. When you're running some of the heavier operations, it gets a little bit more you know, affected. You can always stop your video. I think it's fine. I, I can hear it perfectly well. but. There's always okay. the option of the video. Great. All righty. So then we'll, we'll just kind of keep pressing ahead because we got a few more kind of really exciting uh, things to get through, especially in the collab. But the other part of this clinic and one of the implications of the ability to better characterize the landscape that I want to focus on because it's a, you know, an interest of, of mine, it's an interest of Palace, it's an interest of our research group, and I suppose it's an interest of all of you since you took the time out of your day to come here is how we can use these tools and techniques to better assess and understand things like landscape connectivity. So what we do is we focus on hydrologic connectivity and how hydrologic connectivity controls processes. So in general, in general terms, hydrologic connectivity is the framework that sediments, solutes, and biota can move through and influence or be influenced by landscape function and development. And it's a really interesting question for a lot of different people, but how do these different kind of domains interact and on what spatial and temporal time, uh, scale? So for instance, how does a river couple to a floodplain? How do different habitats grow or decay through time? What are the kind of patterns of these, of these changes? And so there's a diagram on the right here by Ellen Wool that I've always found very, very helpful for kind of thinking about. But essentially we can look at and query connectivity by trying to understand 
if we have certain boundary conditions, such as network configuration, geometry of the valley or geometry of the channel, and we vary an input through it, such as the amount of sediment that's being generated in the, these channels, how much precipitation is raining in a watershed, what are the outputs that we generate over time? How much sediment do we get out of that kind of those boundary conditions? How much water do we get out? What is the pattern of where that sediment and water is going? Um, we can use kind of this connectivity framework to ask a lot of questions on either you know, geomorphology or sediment transport or ecological uh, service. So what influences connectivity? Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a really, really loaded question, right? Because the answer is tons of stuff does. Uh, here I've just kind of plotted some different ways of thinking about connectivity that have been uh, used in the past. So for instance, again, here we have a plot by Ellen Wool looking at how differences in stream gradient in a mountain catchment uh, might lead to kind of hydrologic disconnection or lack of connectivity amongst different stream segments because of things like waterfalls, things like dams. On the right, we have things like process coupling or process connectivity. So this is work by Alicia Sandrowski, looking at how different processes that are, that are active on distributary delta systems influence and feed back into each other. So how does depth, tide, and wind influence things like temperature or nitrates or turbidity? How does flow modulate all of these? We can look at all these different processes and understand their interaction with each other just the same way that we can look at these network dynamics and think about how the net changes in the network might influence connectivity. So what we're going to focus on is looking at tools or techniques of characterizing the landscape that can help us better understand things like hydrologic connectivity, which is one of the main ways that surface processes and ecological systems are mediated or have feedbacks between each other. So again, just two examples of, the, of these processes in action are some work by Matt Hyatt looking at, for instance, channel island processes or exchange in delta systems. So when we have water and sediment coming through a main channel, how does it actually get onto the delta islands and the, and the levees in a way that's necessary to start building land and allowing vegetation to establish itself? And vice versa, how does sediment and nutrients on these islands get back into the channel? Or in another system, using a totally different technique that we didn't talk about yet called uh, interfer interferometric synthetic aperture radar, how can we look at the evolution of water levels in wetlands as a function of discharge in the main channel as shown in these dashed lines here? So how with time is water getting from that channel into the wetlands and bringing necessary fluids and solutes that these ecosystems need to sustain themselves? What we're gonna focus on today and what's a pretty significant research interest of mine is the network structure across different domains. And so when I speak about domains, I wanna point out that we often kind of split and characterize the landscape into things like dendritic upstream catchments. So mountain catchments, like the ones that we've been studying in uh, New Mexico, the kind of transfer zone of these meandering or braided streams, and then a final distributary, such as like these delta systems here. But across all these different domains, they all have a network structure that is both being acted upon, but also acting to modulate the flow of material within these landscapes. So a very kind of typical channel network extraction or workflow that we all, I'm sure most of us are familiar with, and it's the one that you'd be taught in an ArcGIS tutorial, is something like if you have a DEM, you can create a channel network or a stream network in watershed by doing something like taking a DEM, hydrologically correct, connecting it, correcting it to remove pits and little depressions, running a steepest descent flow algorithm over it to actually track how many upstream cells are contributing to it, and then getting things like these channel networks in blue, which relate roughly to where your stream network is, and then also maybe extracting out things like in yellow, your main trunk streams. Now, this is a really great technique and it's super helpful because it can also then let you do things like do more kind of quantitative geomorphology in the landscape. So looking at, for instance, within one of these stream networks, what is the actual kind of profile of relief of the main stream itself versus the bounding slopes? How do these kind of different systems evolve? Like what is the kind of diffusivity processes that are modulating what the bounding ridge elevation is versus the erosional processes that are carving out and forming this convex profile of the stream network? Networks though are dynamic in space and time, right? So in that earlier plot by Ellen, we had channel networks as being kind of a fixed geometry, but that's not necessarily true. And the scale in which they can change is actually pretty interesting. So on the left here, we have just an example of looking at the dynamics of channel networks and channel heads pre and post wildfire. So looking at very, very rapid change in the landscape structure in response to a specific forcing event. So we're using high resolution topography to look at how the position or even occurrence of upstream portions of this channel network in these mountains 
changed because of the modification of the, lands, of the landscape post fire. On a longer time scale, you can see the same processes play out, although due to very different reasons, in terms of geologic scale divide migration and river capture. So again, similar to some of that work that we saw in the keynotes this morning. These networks that we often kind of think about as being constants do change on both really rapid human time scales as well as geologic time scales. And the changing nature of these networks has pretty significant implications for a number of processes and a number of, uh, of, of disciplines such as ecology. Ah, okay. So one of the things that we're going to look at today is things like channel floodplain connectivity. So this is just a nice little diagram showing a kind of you know, conceptual schematic of how far along a given river reach, certain areas of the river with a given discharge condition might start losing material and water to the floodplain. In other areas, they might start gaining water and material from the floodplain. And by better characterizing what is controlling these inputs and these outputs, we might be able to better understand the kind of dynamics of things like channel floodplain connectivity on human and geologic timescales. So we're going to actually play with a version of this model later on in the clinic, but we can look and use we can look at and use both high resolution topography with numerical modeling to look at how things like small scale topography drive things like that channel floodplain connectivity. So here's work from uh, our colleague and groupmate Shazad Rahman uh, here at UT Austin doing very detailed numerical hydrodynamic modeling of the kind of fluxes in and out of the main river channel of the Trinity relative to the floodplain using knowledge gained from understanding of the small scale topography as well as uh, really uh, kind of cool numerical modeling. And we're going to actually run this model for ourselves in a very different domain, but I just want to kind of showcase the potential for using these different tools together to answer some of these questions about connectivity. But the, one of the first steps before we can kind of get to that level of, of numerical modeling or testing some of these hypotheses is we have to just kind of characterize the landscape and see what we have in terms of network structure. So as I mentioned, one of the most common ways of doing this is through that kind of steepest descent flow routing. And I just have plotted an example of here of how that often can lead us astray, particularly in relatively flat loan environments such as deltas or within uh, uh, alluvial valleys. So you can see here that kind of classic channel network delineation uh, flow line versus where the river channel itself actually is. Additionally, on the right here, we can see examples of how man-made objects such as drainage ditches or roads can lead to really spurious results in terms of actually kind of delineating or tracing where our channel network actually is. Now, these are really important because if we want to do really accurate characterization of both what processes are active in the channel network right now, as well as how it might change in the future, we have to understand where our channel network actually is relative to our overall landscape. So there are other ways of doing this. And so this is a lot of the work that Palo's group is focused on. And what we can do is we can use things like curvature-based approaches, such as GeoNet, which is a, another open source tool set um, that we have available for the community to use. And what this does, instead of that steepest descent flow accumulation, is it uses a curvature to essentially threshold different types of objects within the landscape and allows you to do more of an automated approach to landscape analysis. So for instance, here we have some th synthetic topography that's showing us the height here. Then we have Laplacian curvature and geometric curvature. Now the implications of that are different types of features, such as a natural stream channel versus a road versus a drainage ditch, can have very different curvature signals that allow us to then filter our elevation data if we have high enough resolution topography to actually differentiate between what's a natural channel, what's a road, and even what's a natural channel versus what's a drainage ditch. And so it allows us to better kind of characterize the natural channel network of our landscape uh, without running into errors um, associated with some of these kind of artificial features. And so just as an example of that, here we can see just a QQ plot of geometric curvature showing that on different uh, sides of that, of that uh, distribution we have where we have likely channelized regions and where we have likely val valley regions and where we have more hill slope regions. And then we can use that to kind of classify within uh, the landscape where we have likely channels. And here's just a comparison of where we would predict channels to be versus where was the field survey location of those channels, as well as where those channel heads are actually present in the landscape. And see that by doing this more curvature based uh, approach, we can actually get a pretty good idea of what the landscape structure actually looks like relative to kind of classical uh, flow accumulation techniques. Okay, so that said, we're going to go back to the collab. So let me just kind of stop here and transfer back over to um, GitHub.
Okay. Can everyone still see that now? Yep, it went all back. Excellent, okay. Yep. So hopefully then uh, nothing happened in the meantime where you weren't disconnected or you didn't close the notebook or anything like that. If you did, that's fine. We can, uh, you can just rerun everything. We're now gonna actually look at running some of those sorts of schemes and some of this kind of channel network, channel network analysis on the data set that we've been playing with previously. So as I mentioned before, the kind of classical approach to channel network analysis is the steepest descent flow accumulation routing. And so these are just some examples of how those algorithms work. Uh, but basically you rely on using a flow direction associated with calculated from the relative elevations of cells in a matrix to calculate where flow would go to the next cell and then propagating that through your model. And so let's kind of experiment with some of these kind of classical approaches and see how they look within our landscape and compare our high resolution data to our lower resolution SRTM data. So let's first calculate um, a flow accumulation raster, but using both this uh, classic D8 model, which means that you're looking at the eight cells surrounding a pixel, as well as a D infinity model, which allows you to kind of differentiate or have flow going uh, across cell boundaries. Um, and so we're gonna calculate both of those techniques and we're gonna visualize them and see kind of what the differences are. And then we're gonna show what these look like and compare to a GeoNet based curvature approach. Uh, just to kind of highlight what these kind of different things get you, especially uh, using high resolution topography. So we're running the cell here, which is again using white box tools to calculate uh, all these different uh, kind of derivative rasters, such as flow accumulation. So we've now calculated two different types of flow accumulation, as well as smoothing a raster to create, create a hydro hydrologically connect, uh, conditioned raster. And we've done it all in uh, 36 seconds, which is pretty remarkable. Again, kind of the power of using uh, some of these more kind of lightweight, efficient processing tools. We're gonna do the same for our SRTM data. And now let's just like look and see what some of these flow, uh, these flow accumulation or flow writing schemes look like on our DEM. So we're gonna plot now the D8 and the D infinity results of flow, of flow, uh, flow routing for the one meter. Ooh, pretty. Okay. So again, we have our original DEM here. We have our hill shade. We have the D8 and the, the D infinity flow accumulation. So you can see that for the one meter data, both of these actually look very, very similar. We'll look at them in a little more detail because there actually are differences. But overall, both do a fairly good job. But what we've generated here is basically a stream network or a channel network of likely channelized areas based on the accumulation of upstream cells flowing to that. And so we can start seeing that and querying the actual kind of net, uh, network and landscape structure here. So let's do the same for SRTM and see how the SRTM looks and compare it to the LIDAR. Okay, so again, original DEM, here's our hill shade. Here's the D8 flow accumulation and here's the D infinity flow accumulation. Again, at this scale, both look pretty similar, but I think you'll start seeing that if we compare the LIDAR and the SRTM, pretty significant differences, right? Again as you'd expect based on both the cell size and also how we're not quite capturing a lot of these kind of small scale characteristics, especially in the headwater regions. So now we can see, this is, this is using the same accumulation thresholds, by the way, what the SRTM looks like versus what the LIDAR looks like for both of these methods. And you can see that in general, the structure looks pretty good in, in, a, broad, in, a, in a broad swath, right? If you just wanted to understand where a drainage basin was, again, on a large portion of the landscape, using this low resolution data would do a fairly good job, but where it's gonna miss a lot of really important features, especially for a lot of the problems that we care about as people in the earth surface processes, is what's going on in a lot of these kind of smaller headwater regions, as well as the dynamics associated with the transitions between hill slopes and channel divides. So we now have our flow accumulation rasters. We can then take those and actually extract the streams out of them using some sort of threshold. So again, this is just measuring how many cells are flowing in each next cell along a stream profile. Here I'm defining, saying a threshold of a thousand cells, what counts as a stream and what doesn't count as a stream. So I've run those and now I've kind of made some, pre, some predetermined plots just in the interest of time and computation here for us to look at along a small region of the, up, of the upslope area. So here we have our hill slope of the one meter uh, DEM. And here is the result of the stream uh, routing uh, scheme 
using D infinity on that with a thousand cell threshold. So you, again, you can see that overall is doing actually quite a good job, right? We can see the stream located up here. We can see these channels going up towards the divides. We can see where they kind of peter out uh, close to where the uh, channel heads would be in that kind of transition between the channel and hill slope processes. If we look at D8, you can see that it's compared to the D infinity giving results that don't look as realistic or, or have potentially some spurious things. We have a lot more linear linear features uh, being shown here. We have a lot more kind of cross-cutting things. And again, that's because compared to D infinity, D8 has a limited range of areas that I can say a flow line is going, whereas D infinity has an infinity number of, of regions, which is why that kind of gives you more realistic results. If we plot the two of them together, Again, especially given the fact that we're looking at one meter DEM in a really small region of a headwater catchment, overall, they're pretty much in agreement with each other, but the D infinity is giving us a little bit more uh, realistic results. Let's see what the SRTM looks like on top of that. So I plotted here in black the SRTM flow accumulation. In yellow is from the LIDAR, but our background image is the SRTM data. And so again, overall, it's not actually that bad, right? We're ca capturing in general where the divides are. We're capturing in general where our stream is located. But what we're missing are kind of the, a lot of these smaller scale spatial details in terms of like, well, how much of the stream is where, where are the kind of transitions between the hill slope and the channels. Uh, and also you, there's an interesting discussion that we're not gonna get into here about how at coarser resolutions, you would actually calculate the length of your streams to be a lot smaller than they actually are in real life but again, almost just entirely due to the data resolution. Okay, so what about that lower relief alluvial valley? So if you remember, in the previous exercise, we showed with our detrended DEM that in the eastern side of our domain, we have the really kind of steep and rugged mountains, and they transition to a relatively flatter landscape that's being dissected as it drains into the Rio Grande. So what does that mean in terms of flow accumulation? A lot of data sets and a lot of flow accumulation schemes and channel delineation schemes, they all perform pretty well in mountainous areas where you have a relatively good difference between what's a high and what's a low. But they start breaking down when you move to relatively lower relief flatter settings. And so you can see the result of that here. So again, in black, we have our D8 channel network. In yellow, we have our D infinity. But you can see significant difference like deviations in terms of where we would expect channelization to be occurring and where our streams are actually going associated with things like this curve curve feature here which is actually a road so you can see that both of these methods are in some cases picking up the ch where the, the actual natural streams are very well in other cases they're simply following along these man-made features here and so this is one of the biggest challenges with doing channel delineation and channel network extraction in relatively low relief really flat settings. And it, it only gets worse actually in areas like Texas and the Gulf Coast, which is often where we need this sort of data and this sort of accurate characterization the most. So that's where curvature and automated feature extraction can help. Now, GeoNet is a little too um, computationally expensive to run uh, within the collab right now. So I've run these uh, previously, or rather our, our group mate Alec did. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you what the results of the GeoNet workflow are and how they compare to the ones that we've calculated here. But again, GeoNet is completely open source and is able uh, to be used by anyone. So if you're interested in it, please email one of us and we can send you some literature as well as link to the GitHub for you to play with yourself. So we can use things like GeoNet and uh, these hybrid curvature approaches to see if we can better characterize these lower relief landscapes. So let's return to the, hill the headwaters first. And so again, we have our hill shade here. And now we have the curvature attribute that we calculated previously of our, of, of our one meter DEM. And so you can see now that where we have these high, these high curvature values shown here in, yellow, uh, in white rather, are what we're gonna be able to threshold and classify as likely channelized regions. So we have our hill shade, we have our curvature, here's our D8 again in black and D infinity in blue. And then in yellow here, we have our likely channel uh, skeletons from the GeoNet approach. You can see that between these, there's actually some pretty big differences. But you can also see that in this kind of quick and dirty first order pass, we have disconnections between where we're kind of classifying a channel because GeoNet and these curvature-based thresholding approaches don't rely on continuity from an upstream area. They're relying on thresholding of what these curvature maps look like. And then we're modifying them based on the flow accumulation rasters that we're creating. But they don't necessarily have to be continuous because they're not relying on the accumulation of upstream cell area. 
which makes them a lot more useful in things like these flat areas. So if we go back out into the alluvial plain by the Rio Grande, again, here we have the hillshade here, and we have curvature, and then we have DA and GeoNet. So you can see that GeoNet is not really being fooled by the roads in this region. Instead, it's mostly picking up and classifying as likely channel network, just the natural channels itself. And again, that's because we can set different thresholds of curvature that allow us to differentiate between a natural stream network and a man-made feature such as a road. We have a few areas where maybe it is picking up on some things, but again, this is the first pass. If we were doing this for real, we do a lot more kind of refinement and uh, parameterization to better tune that out. But just in this kind of quick and dirty scheme, we can see that we're getting really different results, which lead to a pretty different view of the landscape, especially when we want to do things like query, what kind of different process domains are actually active on this channel network. So that's just kind of a little, little example of GeoNet. I'm sorry you can't run it yourself um, in, the, in the call, but I definitely suggest you play with it and kind of see what it can do uh, for yourself. So now that we have an accurate channel network, we can do a lot of different things with it, right, depending on the sort of question that we want to ask. So I just had a fun little example here of showing what we can do if we have a stream network and a DEM together. And so one thing that you may have heard about is a technique called a height above nearest drainage, which is basically a way of saying if, if you have a landscape and you have areas that are drainages or streams, what, how high is the rest of the landscape relative to the nearest stream or drainage? So it's a way of basically doing rapid prediction of potential flooding and potential inundation. Um, and so we're going to actually do using white box tools a very, a very rough, very simple version of hand modeling because we have now an accurate channel network and we have an accurate DEM and we can just kind of see what some of the results are going to get. This is just more for fun, but it's just kind of showcasing what you can do uh, once you have this sort of data in hand and once you have a decent visualization or, or representation of the channel network within the landscape. So what I just did here was I create use white box tools to create my elevation above the stream. And now I can see here the LiDAR stream network. Uh, ooh, that didn't, that didn't plot as well as I'd like to. Um, we can cut down the, uh, cut down the, the uh, vertical max here. Yeah, so you can start seeing it emerge here as you kind of like tune it down. Um, ooh, I keep doing that to myself. Um, but essentially, like we we basically just really really rapidly built a raster that shows the height of every single portion of the landscape above the nearest portion of that stream network, and we did it all in just about ten or fifteen seconds of calculation. Again, just something just for fun, but just kind of showcasing what we can do once we have kind of this sort of data. Ah, there we go. So again, we have the stream network here, and now we have our kind of height above nearest stream raster. Again, showing the kind of big divide between relatively rugged regions of the mountains and the kind of more low relief areas where we're getting closer to the Rio Grande. But again, this has a lot of implications then, right, in terms of like what sort of process domains there might be, as well as kind of potential connectivity of the landscape where you have less of uh, impedance of getting out of one stream to the next. Okay, so that's that for part one of the, of the, of the hands-on portion. We're gonna go back for just a little bit of an overview of numerical modeling and an introduction to ANUGA, and then we're just gonna play with numerical models for the rest of the day. So before I hop back into the presentation, does anyone have any questions or comments? I see Paula's yeah. having a good discussion. No, no, I was gonna, yeah, no, we, yeah, I was answering some questions here in the background um, about the, the disconnected channels. You can get them connected. So there's an additional module in, in GeoNet that is based on geodesics that applies cost minimization for connecting channels, which has the advantage with respect to steepest descent that if you have disruptions, those are not gonna stop you because it's a global minimization. But this skeleton is very interesting because you can appreciate where there's disruptions, which might be roads, might be landslides and, and so forth. When you're calculating the height above uh, nearest drainage, how are you interpolating in between and, and past the, the channels? So the, the height above nearest drainage is computed from the, the center line to which you drain. So it's your relative height, the relative height of each pixel with respect to the center line of the channel that according to the flow directions you're draining to. Does it make sense, Mike? Of the, one, of the one you're draining to. Okay. Yeah, the one you're draining to, which is where channel density is very important. We use hand as a as a way to do kind of quick and dirty inundation mapping in a sense, kind of fast, uh, simple, um, computationally efficient for firefighters. And 
that's where the density plays a big role because of course, if you have coarser resolution, you're just straining to those main ones and you're kind of missing the smaller scale channels that might flood first. But yeah, it's a, it's a very easy calculation. You just do flow directions, you see where you're draining and then you get that relative height and it will give you a first sense of where things might flood first. John, you're doing awesome. Do you need a glass of water? <laughs> a little coffee. <laughs> I had a quick question. This is Abby yes. here. Um, so you said you could differentiate between natural channels and things like ditches. So what I, that made me think about all the um, man-made navigation channels in the Mississippi Delta. I was curious if you'd be able to differentiate those from like the natural distributaries using this tool. Uh, yes, absolutely. And um, actually that's, a, that's a, an object of interest of, of one of our students in Palace group who's actively mm -hmm. working on that right now, as well as looking at historical maps of what the Delta looked like before those channels were actually created in the first place. Yeah, I will also say that any landscape like the one you're describing, Abby, they're very challenging. Uh, anytime you put artificial mm. features gets very hard because uh, GeoNet is really based on that curvature distribution. And so, you know, one thing is the natural landscape in which we can interpret these shifts in curvature as a signature of natural processes. But once you put artificial features in it, they go into the same PDF. So you're kind of losing the signature of the natural processes. And so if you have a landscape where the artificial features are really dominating, it's gonna be much harder to interpret that PDF, that uh, threshold in a um, probability density function as a signature of natural processes. So we do have ways of doing it. I would say that we also fail in various locations and it will really depend on how strong the, the signature of the natural processes still is. Urban landscapes mm -hmm. and flat landscapes are definitely much harder than a nice steep <laughs> water. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's, cool. that's a really good point. I mean, because I, I showcased it a little bit when we when we did when we were looking at the kind of like flatter western portion of the San Luis landscape. But um, that's I mean, that's still amazing relative relief compared to an area like the Gulf Coast, which you know, coming from Louisiana, you're familiar right. with. Right. Um, and the that, other that, yeah. Go ahead, John. Sorry. No, no, it's, it's just it's it, it often when you're when you're trying to do this or doing projects that involve kind of actually needing to do things like that. You want to kind of try to automate it and do things like feature extraction as much as possible, but there's also always just an element of you need to look at your landscape and see Definitely. What, uh, what, mm -hmm. what people have been doing to it. Right. The, the other thing that I was going to bring up is that another thing that some of these tools like, like GeoNet can do is that you actually don't need to fill the pits, which, you know, from an hydrological perspective, the pressures are actually really, really, really important. And so lots of these methods will require that you fill in all those repressions, but we don't actually need to do that because right. the geodesics will just go through that, which is, which is nice. There was a question from Nicole um, as to whether we, what was it? Oh, if we stop the notebooks that we just run and we just close the tab. You just close the, you can just close the tab. We're gonna, we're gonna open the next notebook in a little bit and then I'll start a new kernel entirely. Which yeah, we need more, to... just Yan, go ahead. Yes, please. My name is Yangora from Florida. And I really uh, confused me the terms, and you mentioned that hydrological connectivity, but hydrological connectivity is more like a, more dynamic, like it can change within the, in a single storm, right? Yes. I, I mean, the, the connectivity you mentioned is more like it's close to the like a structural connectivity. Or that is correct. You are absolutely correct. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah, and so what I'm what I was showcasing in part one of the clinic here is the framework that we can use to observe what potential structural connectivity is. In the next step, we're going to look at potential hydrological connectivity through an numerical model. So I'm just showcasing that we can use these techniques and this data to get a handle on what the kind of boundary conditions or the structure of our landscape is. But you're absolutely right. The hyd hydrological connectivity will vary immensely depending on things like discharge, precipitation conditions, tides, right. uh, sea level, all that sort of stuff. Which um, is more the process-based or functional, exactly. yeah. And I think, and that brings up actually That's another very interesting. Point. Yeah, it's a very good point, and it brings up another thing that is that is interesting to note that, uh, if, apart from the main channels, which you know they're going to carry water at all times, what you know, what something like GeoNet or when you get to LiDAR, what you're seeing is really a signature of this section. So it doesn't necessarily mean that those pathways are actually connecting water. They will be activated during large events, but they're not be carrying water at all times, which is really feeding into this idea of structural connectivity in terms of having that path, which may or may not be active at all times. Right. right. Intermittent stream is a typical example. I yes. Think. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm just showcasing the use of these tools and workflows to give us an idea of what the structural connectivity of the landscape is. 
as a way then of querying and building an understanding of hydrologic connectivity, which is what we do a lot of our work on. And then one more key to comment or questions. And uh, I agree, you mentioned that you are going to use the hydrologic model to reproduce the, the processes, right? I mean, the connectivity processes. Is it true? Uh, to, ex to examine, I mean. You are using model, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, and then I, I agree. So I, I believe the modeling seems like the only way to reproduce the hydrological processes and the investigate the, the connectivity dynamics and details. Yes. Right. Of course, yes, some, are, yeah, some, some papers mentioned about the field scale plus scale connectivity. They, they, they made some observations and they, it looks like very expensive and not, not that affordable. Yeah, I think it depends on the application. The, the network that John was showing, the, the paper with my former PhD student, Alicia, that was actually a time series. That was all time series connected in the, you know, collected in the field over three months. Uh, but you're right, there's, you can do it sometimes, you can do it all the time. And especially for sediment, uh, in that case was water level loggers, which are overall fairly inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And then wind and tides were from, you know, USGS gauges and so forth. But yeah, if you're going into, for example, turbidity, then good luck, right? Collect it everywhere. So we do sometimes a mix. Sometimes we do infer process connectivity from the, from observations, particularly for hydrodynamics or do smaller scale for, you know, other processes like sediment transport. Yeah, it's, it's, it certainly there are limitations and though we'll have, you know, more of these cheap sensors so you can just deploy all the way from remote sensing as well. Yeah. There was another question that popped up. Let's see. Um, well, I have one. So, cool. Hello and John, I'm wondering, so said, I mean, you've worked some in, in Bangladesh where we only have SRTM, but the scale of the features is so large you know, how far can you take these these tools? Because there certainly are still small scale features that you're not gonna pick up in the SRTM, but you know, but the main channels are 10 kilometers across. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really that's a really good point. Hal, I mean, you, you could speak to the, the Bangladesh project in a little more detail, but I mean, as always, you, you have to think about the scale of the feature that you're trying to resolve relative to your technique, right? So in a case like Bangladesh, you know, if, you're, if your main river channels are large enough that, you know, a technique like SRTM can kind of resolve and characterize them easily for a specific question that's the, the more than good enough, right? It's like, for instance, when we were looking at the kind of histograms of elevation values, if all I care about is just the kind of distribution or shape of elevation in this mountainous regime, SRTM does basically the same thing that LIDAR does for me. It's only when I need to kind of answer more specific questions that require more small scale features that I need to move to a different data set. So as always, it's kind of a fit for purpose thing. That's right. And Right, and I would say, Mike, that, you know, Dave Tarbotton and I have talked about this many times, so we usually consider, like, the transition between GeoNet and his tau them at around 5-meter resolution. If you're above 5 meter, if you're, like, a 10-meter resolution, you can still use GeoNet, but the advantages are less. But what you bring up is also a very interesting point in this conversation that, essentially, we are having in model data integration, because even in a case like Bangladesh, right, if you had for example, from drones or, you know, from small LiDAR applications, some snapshot of what a high resolution, you know, topography would look like in a subset of the system, then uh, something that in my group we're really interested in is how do you then go about developing sub scale parameterizations for those smaller scale features and how you're going to embed them into the larger scale models. So lots of the work that we've done is kind of like at the boundary between these two things and trying try to use pockets maybe of information that is finer resolution, and then think about how you're actually gonna put that into the larger scale model, which is a super interesting topic. Right. Okay, I think let's, let's move on to the last portion of cool. it. So we can have some time with the, with the actual modeling, um, which, I, which I hope everyone will enjoy. Um, but this, yeah, I'm really happy we're having this discussion because this, these are a lot of the kind of topics and questions that you know, we, we talk about a lot, but are also a main focus of the RCN. Okay. All right, so last last part of the presentation, and then it's just going to be kind of playing within our sandbox for the rest of the rest of it. Um, so as we were just talking about, right, a big question is, so we have high resolution topography data, and we have these beautiful data sets. So what? What is the utility of them in things like numerical modeling? So when we have high resolution topography, we can use it as an opportunity to better integrate and validate numerical modeling and forecasting. But there's a lot of challenges that come with that, like some of the ones we were just talking about. So we have challenges with computation, 
in terms of how can we run you know a really large domain model using a really small grid size without just taking forever or costing way too much money but there's also a question of just because something's high resolution is it useful if we're trying to answer a question about a process or about a kind of domain that's occurring on a large enough scale do we necessarily need to always use something like high resolution topography and so what we're really trying to do is have better coordination between these kind of different data communities we're trying to oh. Sorry, did someone say something? No, okay. it's all good, John. Go ahead. Okay. Um, better coordination between you know, the data-driven communities and the modeling communities, hence the research coordination network that we're trying to do here. As an example of that, you know, here we have a, a study looking at um, kind of numerical modeling of a flow within an, a bay or an inlet, and we have really, really detailed multi-beam bathymetry at basically one meter resolution. And when we have grid resolution, we're running our Dell 3D models at 50 to 1,000 meters, how do we kind of connect or span those two different domains? And what are some of the kind of ways that we can do that? So in my view, when we think about how high resolution data is used in modeling, there's essentially three different kind of views or ways. One is ideation or conception. So it's the idea that if we can observe a phenomena or process or feature, within the landscape using very high resolution that will help us better formulate a question or format hypothesis that will then be tested with the model, even if the model's not using that data directly per se. Secondly, we have actual input. So this is using high, like high resolution topography data as a direct input into the model, whether it's from attributes like vegetation density or surface roughness, or is the actual kind of base grid that we're going to run a flow accumulation model on or things like validation. So if we're running a model such as uh, you know, beach, uh, beach erosion in, in response to a hurricane, we can use things like pre and post LIDAR, pre and post structure for motion data to test how well our model did in terms of predicting patterns of erosion and deposition. So I'm just gonna run through some examples of kind of work that I've seen that kind of touches upon these kind of three different concepts. So one is this kind of rec recognition of small scale features within a landscape, kind of like what we were just talking about in uh, our test example, the San Luis Mountains. So here's a paper by uh, Jonathan Suba looking at the recognition of these low relief floodplain channels within river systems in Indiana and recognizing that the fact that these exist, even though you can kind of cross scale them or handle them uh, using lower resolution data or even most modeling techniques has pretty significant implications for predicting patterns of flooding and patterns of peak kind of discharge within the river system. In terms of things like input, we have examples like this by Saggy Cohen, looking at how using a very, very high resolution grid, a one meter raster in this case, and actually just running a numerical model directly on that raster helps you better understand patterns of flood inundation in response to specific events. Going a different way, not just using the kind of raster as your kind of base elevation surface, and going back to a little bit about what Paolo was talking about, we can use information from our high resolution data sets to help us parameterize and kind of inform the structure of a domain that we're then going to run a model on. So this is a really cool example looking at a flood, uh, basically flood propagation, but rather than trying to say I'm going to run my flood propagation model over a really, really you know, uh, small cell size raster, I'm going to use the LiDAR data in point cloud format to look at basically the standard deviation of heights within each cell as a function of the elevation surface, and then take that as an input of a roughness coefficient that I can then distribute across a coarser model domain. So essentially using very high resolution data to, to parameterize at a subgrid level a model domain and getting much more accurate results relative to you know, actual measured inundation extent. Um, in terms of things like validation, we have some recent work by Katie Barnhart that's super, super cool. If you haven't read this suite of papers, I highly recommend it. But basically using high resolution topography data from upstate New York and to characterize two different watersheds that kind of touch upon different types of lithology and using these, um, the high resolution topography of the validation watershed to essentially validate numerical models trying to replicate what the calibration watershed is seeing. In terms of like validation, as I mentioned as well, we have things like you know direct measurements of pre and post uh, beach berm extent uh, here in the Gulf of Mexico in response to a hurricane, and then predicting how well a, a model like X Beach did relative to those measured differences from our high resolution data. So those are just kind of a few of the different examples of how we've seen high resolution topography used in data sets. But now I want to kind of get into what we're going to be doing for the rest of our afternoon, or as long as you want to stay with me. 
of how we can actually run our own numeric models and kind of inform them with our high resolution topography data going back to the St. Louis Mountains. So to illustrate a modeling workflow, we're going to be using ANUGA, which is a hydrogenic modeling code from the Australian National University in Geoscience Australia, hence ANUGA, which is a very, very powerful open source solver that allows us to solve a, a depth integrated finite volume shallow water equations across an unstructured triangular mesh. So this was originally developed for tsunami inundation modeling, but it's recently been adapted for more flood and flow modeling as well as sediment transport modeling as in the, also actually uh, erosion modeling. Uh, the use of this unstructured triangular mesh is very cool because it allows us to kind of specify different resolutions and parameter domains within a single study domain. So we can, for instance, model maybe in very high resolution the area directly around our river channel, but then have it start kind of coarsening out as we get further and further into the floodplain, but also change the roughness coefficients of each of those domains as well. So just some examples of how ANUGA has been used in the past before we actually get to playing with it. So here's some work by uh, Marielle Perignon, who was uh, recently of uh, CU Boulder here, using ANUGA to model a uh, flood propagation of the 2013 Front Range flood. So taking uh, high resolution topography data as an input, as well as storm uh, rain gauge measurements of the intensity of storms and transferring that precipitation to discharge about the stream network and modeling what the flood wave that NUGA would predict was versus what was measured in real life. So in this instance here, we have the hydrograph showing uh, in the thin black line, the USGS gauges measured hydrograph and then black, the modeled ANUGA output coming through the system from this high resolution modeling domain and showing actually pretty good uh, correlation between the two, but just like kind of shift in the time lag between them likely due to, you know, things like roughness parameterization within the landscape. So before we start doing it for ourselves, I'm just going to kind of talk through some of the basics of ANUGA and how we set up a model domain. So we specify an overall domain here. So again, this would be like this rectangular area, which is just our overall study region. And then we can specify internal subregions, as I've shown here on this mesh um, that's a little bit denser. We can choose a resolution for our triangular regular mesh for each region. And that resolution is not the same as a raster resolution, where if I say it's 25 square meters, every cell is 25 square meters, the resolution just represents the maximum allowed area for each triangular node. They can actually be smaller. We'll, we'll see what that looks like in a little bit. We can specify a Manning's friction coefficient for each of these regions. And we can also specify boundary conditions of our domain. So for instance, when, it, when the flow, modeled flow hits one of the boundaries, does it reflect off? Does it just go right through? And so on. And then we can specify things like inlet operators, outlet operators. It's a pretty powerful, pretty uh, flexible uh, modeling platform that we we use a lot in our group now. So just showcasing again some of the details of that kind of uh, mesh structure. So you can see this is again some of the work from Shazad, uh, his work on the Trinity River, showing the population of the mesh with very a very high resolution domain about the channel of the river itself, and then coarsening out as we move into the floodplain. But also showing that it's since it's an irregular mesh, not every triangle triangular node within a domain has to be the same cell size as each other. You're just specifying a maximum cell size. All right. So with a little that little bit of an overview uh, into both just kind of how we're seeing numerical modeling using high resolution topography as well as a bit about ANUGA, let's uh let's play with it. Let's actually become numerical modelers for another 15 minutes or however long you guys want to stick with me. So to do that. I'm going to share my screen back again. We're going to go back to the GitHub. And we are going to open the notebook that's labeled part two. So can everyone see that fine? Yeah, so, you're all good. OK. And remember to clean it up. <laughs> yes. So we're going to open, we're going to open uh, the notebook, and then we're going to hit open in Colab again. And the reason why you wanted to close the previous tab before doing this is right now it only runs in Python 2, and everything else we were doing is running in Python 3. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why I had everyone do this in Colab, because trying to get multiple environments and Python versions on everyone's personal machines would be uh, you know, an exercise in frustration. OK, so now that we have our Python notebook opened in Colab, we're going to connect to our runtime again. We're going to get our warning that Python 2 is deprecated in Colab. If we were trying to do this clinic next year, it probably wouldn't work. OK, so we're connected. We're connected to an environment. 
And here we are. So we're going to be looking at modeling flooding in the San Luis Mountains in a region that's just in the northernmost extent of the study area that we were characterizing in part one of the notebook. Um, so you can see here. Did people clear the, the outputs? Sorry, oh, yeah. John. No, thank you for reminding me. Yep. Uh, that's not, that, that was just an embedded image, so not an output. But we're going to now experiment with Anuga over this domain that's, again, just to the northern uh, portion of the watershed that we've previously characterized. So you can see in yellow here that channel network that we delineated previously. And we're going to basically run a flood through the domain shown in the shaded box. And we're going to measure and monitor the evolution of the flood wave at a series of virtual gauges, which I've specified, that are shown uh, here in blue. So the overall domain that we're going to run is about you know, 1,250 meters by 650 meters. Um, also, just a note, this, this exercise was really inspired by a previous clinic that Stephen Roberts of ANU ran uh, in CSDMS 2018. Uh, his clinic was all about Anuga and went to a ton more detail. So if what you see here is interesting or you want to learn more about it, please visit his clinic and visit the main kind of Anuga repository and just kind of get a feel for this. But it's a really, really cool platform. It's pretty powerful in what it can do. Okay. So similar to last time, we're going to clone our GitLab, our GitHub, and bring in all our necessary libraries and install them. So it's going to run here. We're going to get a little uh, finish message when it's all when it's all good. I know we only have 11 minutes left. I promise you, we'll be able to at least run one of these model realizations in the time we have left. While this is loading, does anyone have any questions? Science is good. Yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're almost done installing our environment. Cool. OK, so ready? Next, we'll just import Anuga. All right. Now we're going to set up our model domain. So very similar to the workflow I was showing you in the, uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. So we're going to define our overall bounding region through an extent CSV that I provided. We're going to specify a region about the stream channel that we're going to be looking at. We're going to specify the DEM, again, using our one meter DEM. And then we're going to set a resolution for both of these regions. Again, 100 meters for the kind of broader extent and 25 meters for the area around the channel. So I've set, I, we set those domain boundaries, and then we create our, our mesh. Cool. So now you should see a figure pop up that shows, again, the dense, low, uh, high resolution mesh about the stream and coarsening to the outer edges of the domain. So now that we have a mesh, we're going to set up the initial conditions for our model run. So we're going to just uh, set an elevation. Um, we're going to set our elevation um, from, again, that DEM. We're going to set a friction coefficient. Um, and then we're going to set just like initial stage condition. In this case, we're just going to say everything's dry when the flooding starts, which is actually not an unreasonable approximation for an area like this. All right, so we've set our initial conditions. We've sampled using uh, our DEM and that mesh elevations to each triangular node. So now each triangular node has, a, has an associated elevation value. We're going to set up what the kind of boundary conditions are, whether, and then we're just going to say they're all transmissive. So if water hits the boundary, you can leave it. We're going to set up our initial discharge conditions, in this case, 250 cubic meters per second. And we're going to say we're going to run it uh, for about 200 seconds within the model. OK, so let's run the model and see how it looks. You're going to see the time stepper plotting out every yield step. So you can see that for each yield step, it's taking about two seconds to run. So this overall model run will take about um, 80, 80 to 100 seconds, which is actually pretty fast um, for this sort of model. And then we're actually also going to then create a plot of the evolution of the flow through time along this channel. I have a quick question while yes. waiting. So with the triangular mesh, did we create, I, I'm just 
we're kind of rushing through. Did we create kind of two scales for the channel and the floodplain like you showed in that example? Yes, we did. So, okay. we, so we specified those, sorry. I, right, I, I see it there yeah. and I'm like, when yeah, did yeah. that happen? Yeah, so, we, so in, this, in this first portion, we see we set a base resolution of 100 meters and then a channel resolution of 25 meters. Okay, and they're just two different polygons. And yes, exactly. Right, and Jennifer, that's one of the, the main advantages, I would say, of Anuga in terms of you can actually design these meshes in an extremely simple way. It's really down to just delineating which domain you want finer, which domain you want coarser, and it's very, very easy to do. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so it lets you it lets you really kind of nicely set up all your boundary conditions and use information from you know field data and observational data to say like you know this region is going to correspond with for instance this vegetation type which has you know this potential roughness this region is going to be you know our channel and kind of do all that sort of or all that sort of stuff in a really simple way which is really nice. And yeah, Hannah, this, you're absolutely right. This is very similar uh, in terms of how it's been applied to GeoClaw, uh, which I think they're running a workshop on on Friday, but it's a very good point. Okay, so our first model run is done. And so now we're just gonna, now we're just gonna plot it. That part just takes a few more seconds, but we're almost there, I promise. Okay, so hopefully everyone's model run completed successfully. Hopefully now you have a plotter window with a nice little play bar. So let's play it and see what happens. Ooh. So hopefully you're able to see the flood wave propagating down the stream. So you can see the scale bar here is five meters max, so five meters depth, uh, which no, nowhere in this model is really getting close to. But there's a few things, and we'll, we'll look at more detail in a second, that I want to point out is that you can see that even though we specified a relatively coarse mesh size, 25 square meters for the area around the channel, the actual effective resolution in a lot of these areas is actually a little bit higher because again, that's a maximum area. So you can see that like, for instance, once we get over to the west side of the domain, the pattern of flow is starting to be really affected by a lot of these kind of smaller secondary channels that are located at higher elevations relative to the main channel. And so we can actually look at that in the DEM. And so you can see here within the DEM of our, our study area with a hill shape applied to it, once we get to the western side of things, we actually have multiple channels present within the small scale stream valley. And so that's reflected in these patterns of inundation because you can see that the flow is actually starting to branching and bifurcate to take advantage of these preferential flow paths that exist within the DEM. Even though they're so small scale, you wouldn't necessarily think they're being picked up by the scale of the mesh that we chose. Okay, so like I said, we actually plotted you know, some virtual gauges along here and sampled um, what the flow depths were or the stage was. And so let's actually plot those and see what the timing of the flood wave actually looked like and what that's happening to the inundation depths along those regions. Okay. So there we have our six gauges corresponding to these six gauges along the base of the stream valley. Ooh, the numbers there are plotting. I, I apologize for the scale. It's for some reason wanting to put uh, a, like, yeah. Uh, plotting it in a very, very weird way. But we can, we can get the point across where we can see gauge zero, which is closest to where we're setting our discharge to start, sees the arrival of the flood wave basically immediately. Gauge one sees it a little bit later, gauge two a little bit later, and so on. Gauge five is the last to see it because it's the furthest downstream. Because again, we're modeling a dry bed that then has a constant discharge being applied to it. And we're seeing that bore of water come down the system. So you can, and you can see that once that water arrives, because we're maintaining constant discharge conditions at the inlet, it basically stabilizes at some value and everything just kind of keeps being uh, transported out of the domain to the west. This is not necessarily the case if we were running this domain or this model under more realistic conditions where we would evolve it for a much longer period of time and with an actual hydrograph from an event as the inputs, we'd be actually varying our discharge conditions with time we're specifying just for the sake of playing with this model, just a constant discharge condition uh, and a relatively small uh, uh, amount of time that we're letting the model evolve. Okay, so let's try running the model again with a differing friction value. So the demanding friction coefficient we specified earlier was about 0 0.015, which is already kind of unrealistically uh, high. Let's see what happens when we kick it up to 0 0.03. 
we're going to keep everything else the same. So we're going to run this. And what we're going to, well, this, this cell here, what this is doing is again, just specifying our base and channel resolutions, specifying that in all our domain conditions, and then also specifying the name of the file that we're going to save the second model run to. Now, what's also really cool about Anuga is that all the model output is packaged into something called an SWW file, which is essentially a NetCDF file. So if any of you are familiar with NetCDF, uh, there, it's a very common file format that actually has a lot of kind of pre-existing tools and workflows to kind of sample and process data out of. Um, so by having everything within this sort of wrapper, um, it lets us kind of store and then manipulate model runs after the fact pretty easily. Okay, so we're gonna keep everything the same. We're only gonna change the friction. And now that's what our mesh looks like. Um, let's run the model again and see what it looks like with that kind of different friction. And then we're gonna query those same virtual gauges and see what difference just changing the friction factor made in terms of the timing of the flood as well as the kind of inundation depths that we're experiencing. While this is running, does anyone have any questions? Any questions from the from the Johns, the panel of Johns I'm seeing? You can see it too, it's kind of fun. Numerical modeling doesn't have to be, you know, scary or or intimidating. Um, we can use pretty complex models in a pretty simple way just to start playing with and trying and testing different controls of different boundary conditions and different inputs. Um, and so they're really a great tool for kind of experimenting with what kind of different characterization of the landscape means for, you know, effects like flooding or surface processes or hydraulic connectivity. Um, and this is just kind of a fun way of illustrating that. Uh, Hannah here, I do have one question. Yes. Um, I was wondering when you're running this, are you manually changing the refinement when you're playing with the parameters so then it will run faster? And then are you, or is there like an adaptive mesh refinement uh, kind of section uh, in Anuga where you're able to just uh, let it auto select for you or something like that? Like, and when you say the mesh refinement, you mean like the resolution we're specifying for it? Yes. Uh, we're, we're manually selecting it here. Yeah, so okay. you, you, spe you specify the domains in this case. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we have our output from the second model run. So we can run that. It looks fairly similar, but one thing that you might notice is that it appears to be propagating across the landscape a little slower, and the maximum depth seems to be a little bit higher, but let's see from our gauges whether or not that's actually true. Okay, so now, ooh, this is kind of, this is different from the last time I read it. Um, curious about what it is, but what we can see in general, there's an interesting story emerging where the pattern of inundation in terms of the flow depth, as well as the timing of when that flood arrived are different based on what we changed with the friction. So by increasing the friction factor of the domain of our channel, we've basically slowed the propagation of the flood bore as well as increased the inundation extent. So it's kind of fun to think about how, you know, this might relate to a real world problem. And for instance, again, in these dry watersheds, if for instance, this is a, a watershed that hadn't been occupied for some time and had become heavily vegetated, you might actually have a pretty rough uh, friction factor relative to a continuously occupied, you know, subaqueous channel. And that might then mean pretty big differences in terms of what your kind of predicted maximum inundation uh, extent and depths might be for this landscape. Again, uh, we can pl kind of play with the effect of those parameters using a relatively simple tool like this. Then we just have one final, one final run. So this is again keeping everything constant, but now we're modeling an incredibly unrealistic and fairly catastrophic flood across this domain. Uh, in this case, we're going to run a flood with 5,000 cubic meters per second of water for 2,000 uh, for 200 seconds, and we're just going to see how that compares to the previous ones. And then we can just plot the final gauges of it there. Um, so this though, after this run, this is essentially um, what I had prepared for everyone for the, um, for the clinic and for this portion of the workshop. Um, you know, I'm happy to keep playing with this or answer any questions. Uh, what I was also hoping to have, and I know we're, we're over time now by two minutes, um, is a little bit of a discussion with everyone about 
just what what you guys think. I mean, how do you use high, re high, high resolution topography data in your own work? How do you use modeling? Uh, what are some sort of, of the opportunities that you see for better integration um, and, and a, a kind of path forward for the community to take? Um, I think we can just kind of open it up now to more of a kind of free discussion if anyone doesn't have any more specific comments or questions about what we're doing with the NuGet here. Again, uh, this exercise was more just to kind of illustrate um, how we can kind of use complex models in a simple way to kind of start, you know, playing with different aspects of the landscape and different aspects of connectivity. Uh, but it's also just kind of fun to, to vary some of these parameters and kind of see what happens. Like I'm doing a lot of this in a very unrealistic, uh, very simplistic way versus what you'd actually do um, in a, you know, a more well-characterized study. Uh, I have a question about uh, what you're doing with Anuga and defining those domains between channel and floodplain. Um, I'm sure it's somewhere up in the code and I'm just not seeing it, but how exactly are the, the boundaries between those different domains being defined for the different mesh resolutions and like how, uh, how much certainty is there in that? Right. So the boundaries between the different domains are being set by me uh, in the form of a, of a CSV file for each domain that just essentially has the extents of what I want that domain to be. Um, so if we run back up while the code is still running, uh, let's, let's see here. Okay. So you see when we first imported everything, we imported a bounding polygon and a channel polygon which corresponds to this extent CSV and a channel CSV. So these CSV files essentially just hold a set of XY points uh, that specify the shape of the polygon within the domain that we're gonna call either bounding polygon, which is the overall area, or the channel polygon. And then we also then just specify what the base resolution is and what the channel resolution is. And also that we're defining these regions as what we set as the bounding polygon and the channel polygon. And then when we set up our domain using the Anuga code, that's where we then say, you know, our maximum area is going to correspond to the base resolution. Our interior regions are what we kind of uh, made from our CSV files that we put in. Um, and then that's what then gives us when we set up the domain right here in this domain.set, uh, what our kind of irregular mesh is. And then this is where we just specify, you know, things like elevation. Um, and then sample our elevation file from that mesh that we built. But everything up until this initial condition step was all about setting up the domain and specifying what regions of our mesh we want to be what and the resolution of them. Gotcha, thank you. I mean, it's an interesting question because you could say, how do I get that, right? In terms of, in some cases, you may not know where the boundary is. And I would say, you know, at that point, you would use a higher cube information. You'll get what you can from, for example, cross sections on the LiDAR, and you'll get imagery if you have field data. And if you have completely, you know, if you don't know, then you can always run multiple simulations and kind of vary that boundary in terms of where you change your friction coefficient. And perhaps if you have field observations, get a sense of what's the right uh, parameterization for that coefficient. Mm -hmm. Because I'm guessing that that's all you're thinking, Vanessa, that might be that in some cases it's not that obvious as to where you're going to switch that roughness coefficient and you may want to, you may want to try different ones. I mean, I think in our experience uh, with our work, what usually happens is that we've either gone to the field or we have imagery or we have some other type of remote sensing we can compare to. And if, if you don't know any of this, then some form of Monte Carlo approach of like where you vary that boundary would, would probably be what I would do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, like low relief landscapes where that. Right, where that, and, you know, and the interesting thing is that it's also going to, in some cases, for example, in some of the, the places we work on, it's actually also very seasonal, right? You can have cases in which, you know, during the winter and there isn't a lot of vegetation and then perhaps, you know, that floodplain coefficient is not that different. And then when everything explodes in the summer, you know, Louisiana coast is one of those cases where we want to switch it. So it's also something that temporally you may want to have, you know, you may want to represent seasons as well, which would change what that boundary is. Yeah, and, and, and I 
yeah, I apologize. I think I, I misinterpreted what you're, I thought you were asking where we're specifying within the code, not a more, you know, general question of how we're specifying. No, I think it was both, uh, John. I just, um, I just, I just took off of that because yeah. I, it's, well, it, it's, it's a great an interesting question. question. I mean, yeah, for sure. Because I mean, I, in this example that we're running, it's mostly completely arbitrary. It's maybe a little bit guided by the LIDAR, but I've just chosen, this is where the channel is, this is everything else. Um, like Paolo was saying, like when we've used this in actual, you know, studies, you go out to the field multiple times and you can see, you know, in the winter when all the vegetation, the point virus dies off versus in the summer when everything's kind of growing, you can really kind of get a feel for how that varies, but it varies, you know, pretty substantially. But that's again, where things like, you know, multiple LIDAR surveys and field surveys can really help you kind of delineate these, you know, potential both geomorphic domains, but also these kind of potential, uh, you know, like land classification domains, which might help you then parameterize uh, something for a numerical model like this. All right. So our kind of giant catastrophic flood uh, should be done running. And you can see that the overall inundation is much, much greater than the previous rounds, but it's still pretty well confined to this valley because we're looking at a pretty kind of entrenched niche landscape. If we were running this on landscape like the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which is very low relief, uh, this would look quite different and a lot more interesting in terms of the patterns of inundation of all these kind of small secondary channels that can become activated at different discharge levels. However, uh, when I tried running that uh, within CoLab, it quickly used all the RAM and crashed, which is why we're not doing that uh, today. But it's fun to play with. Um, and then we can kind of plot our final, final figure of gauges. And yeah, just confirming what we see with the visualizations where the massive flood wave is just you know, head and shoulders above the uh, maximum inundation depths being measured of the other kind of modeled uh, discharge values. And also interestingly, over the course of the, um, the model runtime, in most of our locations, we're never actually approaching a steady state, uh, which means that it's still kind of evolving and still actually kind of creeping up and filling up a lot of the topography available to it. So that is just a very, very quick, brief uh, introduction to ANUGA and numerical modeling and some of the concepts of how we might think about kind of characterizing landscape and incorporating those kind of parameters and characterizations into, uh, you know, testing some hypotheses with the model. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop my screen sharing here. Um, sorry, Paul, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, I got a message on Zoom saying that my speaker is not working, which doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, there's just a little uh, bit of static here and there, but it's not a problem. All right. Cool. So with that, guys, that is really the uh, the end of the clinic. So I wanted to thank everyone for you know taking the time, especially since we went over by a few minutes uh, to, to join us today. I hope you had some fun. I hope you learned, learned some things. Um, again, I want to just kind of take the opportunity to open this up for any sorts of discussion or comments or questions or anything that any of you might might have. Um, we're, we're, a, we're a small enough group now, I think we, we're just down to about 15 people that any sort of questions or discussions we can have, we can have much more of an open discussion now. Yeah, and I would say also that, you know, if, if you have to run, that's, you know, it's perfectly understandable. And one thing to keep in mind is that this is one of the themes of our EarthCube RCN. So if these pique your interest and you want to be involved, there's going to be way more to come, especially over the summer. So feel free to email any of us and just uh, get part of the group. Thank you all so much. Yeah, and like Paula said, you know, if you have to run, we have to run. But I, again, we would be interested in, you know, hearing from you if, if you're working on kind of, you know, similar, you know, questions or thinking about how you might use this in your own work. Uh, you know, it's we'd we'd love to have a discussion about that. Right. And also, if you have, like, if you have tried to do this, right, because this is really the, the intersection of modeling and data and, you know, whether you encounter challenges either in one or the other, right, or how you go about analyzing later data, what are those challenges were in how you analyze them or, or things like that. I guess it just to share, um, I've tried doing some of this in GIS and been pretty frustrated and know that there's like, I could do code and, and like have freedom from clicking and that would be wonderful. And just to have these examples um, showing what libraries you're using and, you know, some little snippets here and there, just, I feel like it's so much more accessible suddenly. Um, so I just, yeah, really appreciate like, 
one open source is amazing and then you know having you guys spend all this time putting this together in this way is um you know amazing resource John, for the John. future she's on john's work <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to take credit it's in well, thank you. I'm happy that this this is helpful for you. I mean, I, I hope we just kind of showcase like we barely scratched the surface, right? This is a pretty, pretty like, you know, basic introduction to all this, but I'm really happy that you see, you know, things or elements that you can kind of go into more detail on because it's really a lot of fun uh, to do. Yeah, sometimes it's just overwhelming, like all the different ways to possibly do it. And just to see Absolutely. like somebody's thought about this a lot and this is what they're doing. And like, I can at least start here. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's what we've encountered usually, you know, with, with leather and and that's how I think often sometimes people just will just build another code just because sometimes it's also hard to understand what people have done. This is not well documented. I think that's changing a lot. But what we've always found with, with our research is that there's always the need for some sort of like stamped or approved workflow that you're like, all right, if you, are, if you have to start and you have to do this, this is one way of doing it, right? And I think that we can always improve that type of information or documentation and kind of facilitate um, that exchange within the community, which is gonna help people that get started, but also people that just wanna, you know, don't spend time reinventing the wheel and just using what's been done and then use your time to do something new. Yeah, I could see it's an investment and I just, again, want to thank you, yeah, for making this investment and sharing. Yeah, thank you for joining us. On that note, I just think it's, you know, especially if you're thinking about how to kind of use this sort of stuff or this is, this is for everyone or, you know, share with other people. I also think it's, this is a kind of fun example of how we can use things like Google Colab as like a really good sandbox for kind of playing with a lot of this different stuff does. Cause I know, you know, from personal experience when I was learning, like how easily you can kind of get yourself into trouble trying to manage versions and repositories and libraries on your own machine. Um, and you can start breaking things without quite understanding why things are breaking. Whereas in a virtual environment like Colab, you can kind of just keep everything within a self-contained environment and if it breaks, you can just start over. Yeah, I'd be curious what, what you'd see, where is the limit of that? Like this seems good for trying things and then at some point um, it feels a little insecure. Right, and so I can tell you from making this what some of the limits are. Uh, and the main one is RAM. Um, it doesn't give you that much uh, memory. And so with some, for instance, like going back to like uh, topographic analysis, um, the domain that we are working on was about a 160, 180 megabyte raster, um, which is actually a pretty decent size, but it's a pretty small one by uh, LiDAR standards. Um, and that was pretty, you know, pretty handleable for us. As you can see, we could, we could run flow accumulation across that. We could calculate curvature, we could do all that sort of stuff in just a matter of 10 to 20 seconds. So the computation time is not the problem. What is, is that larger data sets, particularly rasters and arrays, have to be loaded into memory to be computed. And once you get above like 500 to a gigabyte, all your all your memory is gone basically in like 30 to 40 seconds and the, and the runtime will crash. Um, so there's ways around that. You could do things on a more tile approach. Like if you have tons of different tiles, you could just or, uh, you know, operate on all of them sequentially. Um, but using like really big data sets, that's where this thing really starts falling apart just because we don't have the, the memory access that you would really need to do something like that. Um, but other than that, I mean, as you saw, we were actually saving all our outputs in, you know, proper GeoTIFF format. So if you were doing this, if you wanted to just get and play with this sort of stuff and use it in your own work, um, which I, what I've done in the past actually, is you can just download those GeoTIFFs right back to your home directory or into your you know, box folder or Google Drive and then just use them like you would any other output. Because like, as far as Colab is concerned, you're not doing anything special. In it's not like a you know, weird format or a weird environment. You're just using a virtual machine. So all the outputs and everything that we're doing can be saved locally and used just like you would anything else. Uh, so it's pretty powerful in that regard. And it's certainly a perfect teaching tool. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah, I imagine that the RAM, yeah, I could see the little uh, bar there telling us when we were hitting limits. And yeah, I, yeah, I know 
that these files can get humongous. Um, and you don't get any warning either. Once the bar hits, once it peaks out, it just, it's over. Yeah, and this is raster. So if we were to be in point cloud, this would be <laughs> way worse. <laughs> Although interestingly, white box tools, we didn't play with it here, but white box tools actually has uh, the ability to handle point clouds as well. So you could, you could actually execute a full LIDAR workflow using these open source tools of like taking a point cloud, turning it into cool. a master and so on. It's very cool. I have a question that's maybe a little bit out there or uh, maybe just not really known, but um, with what you were showing us about all the different uh, you know, the resolution that you can get from this really, or all the different, you know, landscape detail that you can see from this high resolution data. Um, I guess I can see how that's, you know, something that's really important to have a handle on when the question that you're asking is something that you want to kind of solve on a human time scale. Um, but in terms of like, you know, controlling things like channel initiation, like how important are these little details when you're looking at million year time scales. I mean, is that, I guess what it, kind of the angle I'm coming from this with this from is that I'm, you know, doing this work with trying to like reconstruct a paleo surface, uh, which is obviously going to be pretty low resolution. I don't really have a choice in that, but I'm just wondering, you know, what, what kind of different results would I expect if I had access to all of these little details? No, that's, that's a great question. I mean, and that's, that kind of touches on some of the things we were talking about with like, how we would use this data within modeling. And I feel that for a lot of these things, like for instance, if you wanted to kind of run over a really large scale landscape evolution model on millennial scales of like running stream power and how stream power starts affecting drainage divide migration and capture and whatnot, I don't necessarily know if you'd have a huge difference between using a very coarse resolution or a very fine resolution. What I think the fine resolution really gets you is more in that kind of ideation or concept stage in terms of trying to understand what scale of parameterization or what scale of feature do you need to kind of incorporate and are there parameters that you would need or your model would benefit from having included that even if you're not kind of using at the same spatial scale, you know that those kind of smaller scale processes exist and are important in the landscape on these time scales. And so on a longer time scale, you need to think about a way of modeling them or incorporating them, even if you're not running them at that same kind of high resolution, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's a super interesting question. I would say that some of those stream captures and things that do happen at the headwater, at the headwater streams, right? And so detecting those channel heads plays a role. Now, it, it is true that, of course, you have limitations. So it is interesting to me, it, it's such a, you know, it's a big question because it's always the, and it kind of came up in, in John's slides as well, if you have high resolution topography, is that appropriate all the time? And it's not necessarily gonna be the case, right? It's not that because the data is gonna to go to one millimeter resolution that you have to run the model at one millimeter resolution. But having the ability of, you know, even if you're going over geologic time scales, just representing what that subgrid component looks like, then perhaps you can run the model and then re-embed those features uh, in future scenarios as well. It is your question that made me think about um, Greg and Kate Barnhart work where they did that set um, that landscape that had nuclear waste, right? And they were trying to understand the evolution of these nuclear waste and where it would go. So they had to run over longer time scales, and of course they couldn't necessarily get back what the specific um, distribution of these features was not specifically the actual location, but they could get a distribution of the elevation and kind of get a sense of where that subgrid played a role. So it, it's super interesting and it, it does depend on the question. And I think if we have the ability of getting that data, then we can, we can address where we want to include that and, and not. Right. And as a follow up on that, like, I think, just thinking about some of the things that I've done in my own work or things that I've noticed that, you know, I, I'm really curious about or, or interested in, for instance, like using stream power to, you know, model erosion on the landscape or relative erosion off, you know, heavily relies on the slope right of the channel. In a lot of landscapes, your kind of calculated slope is drastically different depending on the, the resolution you're using to, to capture that. So for instance, like the, the, 
even in using 10 meter resolution data versus one meter resolution data in the Gulf Coast, looking at some of the smaller stream values, uh, the 10 meter data under represents the length of those stream networks by an order of uh, sometimes 20 to 50 kilometers and thus under represents or over, over represents the steepness by uh, about two or three times um, simply because the large the lower resolution data is not capturing the small scale uh, meandering of that's actually present in a lot of these river and stream networks um, so there's a lot of kind of really interesting implications for that right it's like because we get into that scale of like what what scale of do we need to really accurately characterize the landscape and we saw that some things you know, maybe course the resolution does a good job but then when we go to the smaller scale we can see you know even if we're in a you know relatively steep mountainous environment those streams can actually have pretty significant meandering in the gravel bread river systems and that meandering is really really efficient at reducing the overall gradient of the stream and so then you can maybe think about what sort of kind of sensitivity tests or uncertainty do you need to propagate into your model to account for the kind of range of distributions that you might expect based on what you see in small scale but again like Paula said even if you're not using that small scale data itself like to evolve over over time the other thing I was thinking about is really the theme of these CSDMS meeting, right? Because I think for those that really work at the as in, on the interaction between topography and vegetation, then I think those fine scale features are really going to be important from an ecosystem perspective, where you have the you know smaller scale features and patterns and patches of vegetation. Those actually play a big role. So again, it depends on the question, but I think for the for the theme of of this year's CSDMS, I could see. The, the fine scale structures really play an important role when it comes down to, to ecosystem because talking about connectivity, you know, it's all about vegetation patches and size and distribution. And that plays, we, we know already from our work that plays a huge role when you, when you look at transport. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's all really good stuff to think about. So thank you for those thoughts. Any other comments, general questions, concerns? Oh, we're just gonna see this part of our first year. Exactly. Hi, John. Cool. Well then, if that's that's everything, if there's nothing from the Johns, um, I think we can we can go ahead and uh, call it an afternoon. Um, again, thank you everyone so much for joining us, um, especially in this virtual format. I'm glad that people found it useful. I'm glad everyone kind of stayed engaged with it. Um, yeah, looking forward to hopefully seeing everyone next year at CSDMS or AGU or something else. Well, thanks everyone. And I think CSDMS sent an email about the uh, impromptu happy hour. So those of you that want to jump in, I think there's a Zoom get together, which is informal over uh, two hours. So I think from now to an hour and a half from now. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Keynotes. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Bye. John is weird. Uh, Chris is weird to see you, John. <laughs> It's too funny. Yeah, it's too funny. So, John. Yeah, thank you, Chris. <laughs> All right, catch up with y'all later. Nice job. Bye, Chris. Bye.